Hello everyone and welcome back to What a Barb, a Pollen podcast. I'm Oz and this week I'm joined again by Lecky, Beans and Veg as we finally finish up the last of our season three production episodes. Oh my god, what a journey it has been. But first up, how is everyone? First up, most importantly, Beans, how is Biscuit? The crowds want to know. Uh, Biscuit is great. Thank you for all the love. She's currently <laughs> sitting in the sun, Aww. staring directly at me. It is unnerving how much she's staring at me. Oh, little stalker. <laughs> <laughs> She's becoming more talkative. Mm. She wakes me up every morning by going, Brr, meow. <laughs> <laughs> Today, so I have my laundry sorted because it's like cleaning day. And she picked up a washcloth with her mouth and just started walking around with it like a dog. Like yeah. she does spend a lot of time with my mom's dogs who are currently here with me. So she's picking up some of their dog-like tendencies. Mm. Oh, yeah. Very cute. Yeah. And are you good, my beans? I'm good. Yeah, I just... It, like I said, it's Sunday, so I'm, I just have been cleaning and then like getting ready for the week. So I'm making yogurt and I'm making bread. And then that's pretty much it. A little domestic goddess. I started watching a new show and it's terrifying and I love it. Your taste will never cease to amaze me. It's a Korean show called Revenant and it's about an evil spirit that possesses this woman and basically the evil spirit kills people around her that she wants to disappear and the more the spirit kills the stronger it gets to until it completely possesses the human and then like takes over her life. This was the first episode, by the way. This was the yeah. plot of the first episode, as she described it to me. Lighthearted. That sounds like the entire arc of the season. That's not even half of the first episode either. So that's just like a tidbit. You think Bridgerton <laughs> has tangents? Subplots? <laughs> Start watching Korean dramas. So you're doing good? I don't know if that's a good <laughs> thing that you're watching that or... <laughs> Yeah, I like it. The acting's great. You're doing better than the people in the show, by the sound of it. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm not possessed, you know. <laughs> I went to the art museum um, yesterday. It was a free day. Last time I went, I cried because I got ghosted. And I cried in front of a picture of some dead fish. <laughs> And this time I didn't. But you did go to see the dead fish painting again. Yeah, my old friend. <laughs> Lack, you good? I, I don't know, really don't know how to transition from possessions and dead fish. <laughs> I have good news and I have humiliating news. My good news is I got mm -hmm. tickets to see my favorite band, The Killers. Um, they're doing their <gasps> Hot Fuss album in its entirety this August in Vegas, which is going to be super fun. And then yesterday I went to the hair salon and I very, very badly needed, like I have wavy curly hair, like my haircut. And I was standing against this wall and one of my curls got caught on like this fake vine and like as I was trying to like disentangle it this woman came around the corner and she was like sorry about that you can sit over here <laughs> oh like yeah did she just pick that curl up and just like chop it yeah I told my stylist I'm like I'm pretty sure I'm due for a taming because I just got stuck on your greenery on the wall <laughs> oh like you went in like Myrthmopolis <laughs> yes vegetable you good yes I have been growing out my fingernails and that's everything you missed on glue <laughs> well Veg will pray for your nails, my love. Thank you. Yeah. How are you, Avs? <laughs> I'm fine. I'm fine. You know me. But we're all doing good then, I guess. Mm -hmm. Before we begin our final crumbs excavation, let's go check out the breaking crumbs of the week. Well, hello there. I don't have Lecky with me this week in the crumbs room. Welcome, Vegetable. Welcome, welcome. Take a seat. Have you got some crumbs for us? Yes, I will try to fill Lecky's very shiny shoes. Yeah, so I guess let's jump in. It feels like it's been quite a while actually since our last crumbs. So here's an update on what has been going on since our last episode. Mm -hmm. First up, we've had even more interview clips from the Valentine's Day event. They just keep coming. <laughs> so on the red carpet, we had something from Ajoa Ando. She was talking about working with Nicola Coughlin and the potential Lady D and Penn storyline in season three, which is very exciting. So mm -hmm. Ajoa said... I think Lady Danbury and Penelope share a common theme about having to find their own way in the world by the dint of their own strategy and their own abilities as a human being, not because mm -hmm. of how they look or how they are regarded in society. They have to force their way through the world. I love this. Such like power resonating from those words. I am so excited that this relationship has been confirmed. We were so worried that it wasn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. And then look, Adjua's here to the rescue as always. What else did she have for us? Oh, well, Adjua just delivers, doesn't she? 
Always. <laughs> also, in an interview with Hollywood Life, she elaborated on this. She said, I think we see in season three, Lady Danbury can see Penelope Featherington. She can see there's another woman who's having to use her wit and her intelligence and her smarts to navigate the situation she finds herself in. I think Lady Danbury applauds that mightily. As do we. Yeah. And in another interview, oh, she's so good. She feeds us. <laughs> so this was with Brit and Co. She added that Lady Danbury sees Penelope as someone who is rather brilliant, who is rather overlooked and undervalued. She resonates with that person, so she's team Penelope all the way. She's cheering for her. Me too, babe. Tell you now, Lady D was the OG pollen shipper way back Ooh. in 1824. She's been at it for 200 years oh, now. Love it. Further to that, she added that audiences will understand Lady Danbury's investment in the Bridgerton children in a more particular way, because we now know about her beloved Lord Ledger. You'll understand the deep affection she holds for this family, which is mm. kind of reassuring. This is exciting though, because she's invested doubly in Pollen, because she yeah. loves Penelope for her own self as a character, as an individual, but then she also has affection for Colin as the grandson. So like, she mm. is fully on board. She is driving that train and we're all on board with her. Um, and in one final Lady Danbury hint, Ajoa revealed that season three will have the character for being slightly less on top of everything and slightly less in charge. It's interesting to see people who feel like they're in control of the world around them and then suddenly something comes left field. Or someone. Ooh. What else have you got for me, Veg? Oh, well, we have a few new crumbs, courtesy of Nicola. In another interview from guess where the valentine's event <laughs> shocking <laughs> nicholas said i think the beautiful thing about this season is that they finally have their guards down with one another they have known mm -hmm. each other since they were kids and oh. they've always just enjoyed each other's company so much as they've grown older they've become a little more self-conscious but it's different this season Ooh. you have the biggest smile on her face it's adorable <laughs> but I wonder, do you think we're going to see that then? Do you think we're going to see when they were children in that original oh less self-conscious state? I really hope so. Adorable. There are hints, right? And they do love a flashback. I'm telling you now, in this teaser trailer that's got to be coming up soon, I don't oh, know when, but... March 25th, that's what I'm telling everyone in DMs who asked me. I'm like... Are you banking March 25th? <laughs> it's as good as any, you know. I'm just hoping that we get, like, I mean, like, the tiniest split second of baby pollen. That's all I need in my soul. Oh. Speaking of pollen, as if we speak about much else, what else you got for us? We had a lovely new clip of Nick and Newt's where they described the season as unpredictable, romantic and suspenseful, which mm -hmm. was some of those words we've heard before, but love to hear them again. Thanks very much, Nick and Newt's. We love them all the same. Good to know all our predictions will be completely wrong. <laughs> and Nicola also attended Paris Fashion Week. She is amazing fashionista. <gasps> I love her outfit so much. She looked incredible, beautiful. And she was interviewed by Harper's Bazaar. She talked about her personal style, her fashion icons, and also left us with a couple of Bridgerton promo crumbs. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you so much. She said she'd been working with her stylist to look for overarching themes in fashion and what will work for the story we want to tell. For example, the Bridgerton press tour we're embarking on at the moment is going to be a month-long thing. So it's about looking at what you want to put across. In previous seasons, I've not been the leading lady. In this one, I am. So we're definitely taking it in that direction this time. So it feels like a really fun way to advance it. Oh, month-long press tour. Oh, veg. <laughs> Oh my god. On a, I was on a walk today and I saw filming people at Royal Naval College and I had a heart attack. I thought it was the press tour, but I don't think it was. Alas, it is not. Well, we're not sleeping anytime soon, are we, Veg? A month-long <laughs> press tour. My god. Gosh. Well, I hope Brazil gets a visit. <laughs> They've earned it. Brazil, you surely are on the itinerary there. Fashion correspondent Veg will be on hand to mm -hmm. break down all of Nick's. Because this thing, she loves a bit of storytelling through her press mm. outfits. You'll be ready and watching. That black outfit with red lip look she posted this week. Oh, obsessed. Tyson. So looking at the rest of the cast, Jonathan mm -hmm. Bailey, my favourite person in the whole world, recently took part in the role play game for BAFTA, during which he talked about his time playing Anthony. After reflecting on his experience being cast in the show, Johnny turned his thoughts towards Anthony's future role, saying, I look forward to supporting the rest of the family and the stories that go forward. Aww. Because if there's one thing I know about beloved worlds as you want to see them through, and people invest their love and their time, and it means so much to so many people. So yeah, me and Tony Aww. will be together for a while. Beautiful, <sighs> beautiful news. Anthony for the long haul. Right. And one of my first celebrity crushes was Fierro from Wicked, particularly when he wears those cream coloured trousers. So can't wait to see him in his other roles. Can't wait for Thanksgiving. <laughs> no, no, we can't wait for May and June. Let's just get through those yeah. first before we worry about Fierro. <laughs> So elsewhere during the roleplay game, Johnny talked about how interesting he finds parent-children dynamics and hilariously 
And curiously, Johnny mm-hmm. froze a little as it looked like he maybe started to worry that he was giving too much away for his certain upcoming role. Mm-hmm. He said, I'm quite excited about playing... Mm, like, <laughs> yeah, paternal. <laughs> yeah, roles maybe. Let's see, who knows? <laughs> oh, bless him. It was like that as well, wasn't it? You could see he was like, oh no. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And he didn't know how to get out of it. Someone on Netflix has terrified them all. They really have put the fear of God into them all. Mm-hmm. So an article from the Economic Times, of oh. all places, mm-hmm. has been making the rounds this week and has caused quite the stir. They've described the new character, Lady Tinny Arnold, as a potential distraction for Colin. And this has sent the fans into a bit of a panic. After much digging, we just wanted to clear things up. Do you want to be the harbinger of good news? I will. First of all, just a call to action, a rally of the troops. Guys, we are the fandom that survived the dark sex plot line of New Year's Eve and New Year's Day 2022-2023. We've been through tough times. We've survived them. We can get through this difficult moment as well. Okay, so this news article from the Economic Times, it looks like it's been written by AI and it isn't based on anything official. When it comes to Lady Tilly Arnold, the only official information we've ever heard about her character was from the Deadline article, which was sanctioned by Shondaland and Netflix. Like It was an official casting announcement from October 2022. We read the character breakdown in a past Crumbs episode, we'll link the episode, but... Lady Tilly Arnold has never been officially connected to Colin in any capacity. This article is pure speculation. It's actually, we think it's harvesting a previous article that was based entirely on Reddit speculation. So, you know, we've really brought this one on ourselves, haven't we, kids? But (laughs) don't panic. It's pure speculation. She's not been confirmed as having anything to do with Colin. In fact, she hasn't been confirmed as having anything to do with anyone. We can get through this moment. Stay strong. I have full faith that Colin Bridgerton will be 100% down for Penn. Pretty much from the second, his little toes step back on British soil. Thank you. In author news, Julia mm-hmm. Quinn attended the International Delight Coffee and Courting event in New York. <laughs> um, so this is celebrating the brand's collaboration of mm-hmm. Coffee Creamers. And at the event, Julia shared a little dating advice from the perspective of the Bridgerton characters. So Julia said that Penn's advice would be to have hope. Whereas Aww. Colin would say, you might find love where you least expect it. I mean, it depends which version of Colin is saying that, I have to say. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We'll maybe leave Colin for this one. Have we got anyone else we can turn to? Yeah, she gave a little hint at the Anthony that we can expect in season three. She said that his advice would end up being really sappy. He's the one who didn't believe in love and then fell hard. So he would probably wax on about how amazing his wife is and make it a little bit about him. I appreciate that, but Colin is the my wife Bridgerton, isn't he? Veg, I'm always amazed at the character growth you've undergone over the last year. It's been a journey and an honour to watch this happen to you. I even went to Italy last week. We're very inspired. But, you know, I'm so happy to have Anthony being sappy over his wife. We can take that. No problem at all. Thank Mm you. What else is going on then? Well, Nicola has a couple of other projects coming up. It's Mm -hmm. been announced that she's going to host a new podcast. Oh my gosh. (laughs) It's going to be titled... It's going to be titled History's Youngest Heroes, where she'll be sharing jaw-dropping tales of heroism, deception, and acts of bravery and resistance. And to US and Canada fans, mark your calendars, because next show, Big Mood, is set to premiere on Tubi. Tubi? Tubi. I don't know why the two Brits are doing this. I have no idea. Tubi? No. Tu- t- is, it like tubi? is it like to be or not to be? Don't know. It's probably the Tubi. Don't people call the TV the tube? Anyway, listeners, we've had a lot of discussions with Beans and Lecky because they find it funny that we say tuna and they say tuna. 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 So I'm going to assume it's Tubi. It's going to be on Tubi in April. It's going to be on Tubi. Go and watch the show. You, I mean, you said mark your calendars. Just mark a big circle around April because we don't actually have a fucking yeah. clue what date in April. But you know, at some point in the coming weeks, Veg, in the coming weeks. If anyone's got a little spare cash and you've already invested in the creamers, then you should be having a great time otherwise. Don't worry, there's plenty of new merch on its way. First up, a new Bridgerton collaboration was announced with Ruggable. Mm. If you're in the market for a nice Regency rug, do I have some good news for you? They've got rugs and inspired by Lady Whistledown, Queen Charlotte, and an intriguingly named Knight of Enchantment rug. 
Ooh, ooh. We search for crumbs everywhere, don't we? Speaking of merch, Shondaland and Netflix have collaborated with four emerging female artists, love it, who have each designed a Bridgerton inspired collection. And these collabs are going to be announced throughout March in celebration of International Women's Month. Oh my God, do we have a month? I thought we had a yeah. day. No, it's day tomorrow Stick. on the 8th, but it's a whole month from here on out. Oh. And on March 7th, the first collection was announced as being designed by Sue Tsai. Sue's collection features a teapot set, a varsity jacket and a scarf. And the designs include bees, diamonds and a lady whistle down origami butterflies. Oh, very oh, nice. I've never had a varsity jacket because I'm not No, because we're British, babe. Yeah. That'll be for why. <laughs> So do keep an eye. Oh, no, I'll tell you a lie. I did have one from Forever 21 for a spell when I was like 15. You lived in Texas, so. Hmm. So keep an eye out for the remaining collections from the artists, which are due to be announced very soon. Mm-hmm. In a little, little bit of fan news, there's a group of Pollen fans who have organised a fundraiser called the Pollen Fan Arts for a Cause Raffle. Basically a raffle where fans can buy tickets for a chance of winning one of the unique Pollen artwork pieces on offer by a number of the well-known and well-loved fan artists. And this fundraiser is currently running until the 11th of March so you'll be listening to this on the night so get your shift on and the funds are being donated to Care for Gaza. We will include a link to the organizer's website if you'd like to enter and donate. Mm -hmm. And finally in awards news Shonda Rhimes has been nominated for the Episodic Drama Award at the 2024 Writers Guild Awards for her work on episode six of Queen Charlotte Crown Jewels. That was a good one. Mm-hmm. And season two costume designer Sophie Canale was the winner of the Excellence in Contemporary Film Award at the 26th Costume Designers Guild Awards for her work on Saltburn. Oh, congratulations. What a lovely night to end yeah. on. Thank you, Veg. It's been a busy old time, hasn't it? Yes, very busy. It's been an honour to have you here in the crumbs room with me. Before we return back to our normal episode, just to clarify, the rest of the episode, everything up until me and Lucky go and do our post excavation, we recorded this. Do you know how long ago we recorded this, Veg? Well, over a month ago a different lifetime so we recorded this well in advance of Remarkable Shade of Blue we didn't have the moonlight scene and we didn't have anything from the Valentine's Day we were mere (laughs) children we knew nothing we ended up postponing the release of this episode because we got all those crumbs so we're going to put it out but it's a little bit outdated and so poor editing Veg and poor editing Lecky are fighting for their little lives in the (laughs) editor's notes trying to like fill in the gaps where we say something and then we have to chip in with a bit of updated news so just bear with us it's a bit of a chaotic episode to make it worse we had to split it into two episodes because when we recorded it we talked for three and a half hours and we can't put out a three and a half hour episode so bear with enjoy the rest of the chaotic episode we'll bring part two to you at some point soon but in the meantime veg should we travel back in time to i don't remember january february who knows at this point and go hunt down <laughs> <laughs> some block four part one crumbs <laughs> It's Beans from the Abyss. Hi, it's me. I'm Beans. <laughs> when we were recording this episode, I realized that we had forgotten to talk about one of the locations that Bridgerton was filming. In mid to late October, Bridgerton was filming at a place called Burgley House outside of London. And we believe from what we've seen from actors and dancers that were on set is that it is going to be a ball. It was a lot of overnight shoots. It was a week-long shoot at Berkeley House. This specific location has never been used in Bridgerton before, and it is gorgeous and beautiful and gargantuan and has some of the most incredible rooms, including one place called a hell staircase. So yeah, We will post pictures of this place. It's absolutely stunning. It's gorgeous. It's a huge location. And we know for a fact that there will be a ball there. And I'm so excited to see what it is. So not to confuse anybody, this was filmed during block two. End of block two before they went on their mid-season break to pick up for block three. And uh, yeah, there you go. I hope you had a good time. I hope you are having a wonderful time listening to this podcast, and I'll see you again in just a few seconds. Ta-ta for now! 
thank you for that. But now it's time to kick things off, pick up our trowels one last time and venture back into the Pullen archives to complete our sacred quest to hunt down every season three production crumb we possibly could. We finally got here, thank God. In our last episode, we covered block three of production, including some of our predictions for episode five and episode six of season three. But Beans, what will we be covering this week? Okay, blah, blah, blah. Today, we will finally be reaching the last block of (laughs) filming on season three. The promised land. So mostly covering episodes seven and eight. However, I will say that during this block, they also filmed pickups for other episodes. Yes. Most notably when they visited Bath in January 2023 to film scenes for episode one a whole year ago. A whole damn year ago. <laughs> uh, How time flies. Mm-hmm. Production on the block began in mid-January after the cast and crew returned from their festive break and the show officially wrapped on Sunday the 12th of March. Towards the end, the cast and crew were working six-day work weeks, so a huge shout out to everybody on production. And Beans, do we know who our director will be for this last vlog? We sure do. Thank you. (laughs) Thanks to an interview he did with TV Line back in May of 2023, uh, we know for Mm -hmm. sure that the director of episodes seven and eight will be none other than Tom Verica. (laughs) Tom will be a very familiar name to the fans as he has directed episodes of Bridgerton in the past. He is an executive producer on the show and he also directed all of Queen Charlotte. So welcome back. Tom, welcome back. Mm-hmm. He's a really beautiful director, and we can't wait to see what he does with the final two episodes of the season. Yes. Mm-hmm. One last disclaimer from us. Just a reminder that these episodes are pure speculation, and we could be very wrong on anything we say, including dates, location, scenes, and our interpretation of filming weeks. We'll be linking everything in our show notes if you want to go and check out photos, the original sources, videos, and so on. So happy clowning. But before we jump into the crumbs themselves, let's just have a little pause of thought. We like to have a muse about what could be coming up. Mm -hmm. towards the end now i think i could say for everyone we don't really know what could happen in episode seven and eight yeah we know from season one and season two that this is this point in the story where they have the big drama something insurmountable happens potential scandal yeah it feels like the couples have been pulled apart either emotionally physically or both Mm -hmm. and it feels like the happy ending is out of reach before we get the final happy ever after and epilogue in episode eight i have to say that to me episode eight always feels a bit like an exhale like it's always episode seven that is extraordinarily stressful Mm -hmm. so episode seven at least for me, it's still very dramatic, but it is the Mm -hmm. fallout of the drama from the previous episode. Yes. Something happens at the end of episode six, right? Yeah, Mm -hmm. something happens at the end of episode six, and then there is still a lot of tension and everything, but it's everybody else finally reacting to what is happening between the main couple. Yes. So this might Mm -hmm. just very well be the Bridgertons realizing that Colin likes the Penelope for the first time ever. <laughs> yeah. Finally getting there on the wedding day. Yeah. It's kind of like a tension is in the air. Yeah. Seven is is so up in the air for me, I think. I don't know what it's gonna... It really could go so many different yeah. ways. Mm-hmm. And then episode eight, it's usually like quite bittersweet. The resolution. Yeah, and obviously the happy ever after. And you know, we've got a lot of loose threads to be tying up in these last two episodes. So, I mean, just within the pollen storyline, we have a potential search by the queen, the blackmail plot. We're hoping for a wedding, which we'll get to. Maybe a public declaration of some kind from Colin I know a lot of fans are after that mm-hmm. we need all of their problems to be sorted out before they get their happy ever after and their epilogue but then thinking about the other characters we have Ben Lady Tilly possibly their possible scandal fallout maybe even a possible masquerade if we want to set up the next season mm-hmm. we've got the Pin Louise reconciliation if they are going to reconcile and what Eloise is going to do next Fran and John they'll be still kicking around maybe a Cantony baby maybe some decisions Cantony making about their family who knows plus potentially people finding out that Penny is Lady Wilson yeah some Bridgerton's perhaps. Beans, you were just saying that episode seven is often the family especially reacting to something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Could it be the older Bridgerton's reacting to yeah. Colin maybe going and seeking their help or then finding out in some other way? Maybe they needed to like, they need to reach out to the Bridgerton's in order to get help because of the blackmail plot. Yeah. Or even if yeah. Queen Charlotte is on Penn's back too. Yeah. And Colin has to be like, we need to go to our families. So it could be both the Bridgerton's mm-hmm. and the Featheringtons. 
Yeah, I was going to say that's kind of what we see in, especially in season one, like the whole family comes together to deal with the conflict. And in in episode seven of season two, like there's the harmony ball and they're not necessarily like working through all of that together, but they're together when it happens. So I feel like it's going to be everybody in the family on board dealing with the drama of the blackmail plot and Lady Whistledown problem. I know we all want the like family dinner between the Bridgertons and the Featheringtons. Mm -hmm. I feel like this particular episode might be one of the best ones to have it even though it's a little bit mm-hmm. late in the season because it could be the Featheringtons and the Bridgertons finding out together that Penn is Lady Whistledown and that could make for some mm-hmm. like really hilarious comedy bits I think as well. That could be funny like yeah. a little callback to that scene in season one where they're yeah. at the dinner table with Simon and Colin makes the quip about Lady Whistledown being a she Yeah. But yeah I think these two episodes are really the hardest ones to pin down because we have no idea what kind of twist on London going to throw in and I think we all know that there are going to be twists thrown in. Mm -hmm. The thing about these two episodes is this could be the culmination of the pen it might be coming at her from different angles so it might be the blackmail plot Mm -hmm. and the Queen's search for her ramping up together and that'll be a very interesting position that they're in and we've said this before but we don't think that these episodes will be the two of them being apart from one another we do think it'll be the two of them against something else Mm -hmm. because by this point the conflict will be then against the Lady Whistledown pressure from the external forces. And we know that happens in general with the Bridgertons as well mm-hmm. and even a last season at the end with Portia being like these are my girls I protect my girls mm-hmm. that the family always comes together for their own yeah and we've got that promised five minutes of happy ever after <laughs> but for now let's go see what we can find in the ancient sites of January to March 2023 exactly one year ago happy anniversary one and all Now, as you will see, this was a truly chaotic block. So we're starting as we mean to go on with one of the most iconic days we've ever known in the fandom. We're starting on 9th of January, 2022, the day of Nicola Cochran's birthday. And what a gift was delivered to all of us on this already very special day. My, 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 do you remember this going down? In fact, what I will say is at this point, everyone was feeling a little bit down and out because we'd fully convinced ourselves we would get something on Christmas day, 2022. There was live chat, expectations were through the roof. And we really believed we might get a first look at season three. And then like, what did we get? got a little tribute to season one celebrating the anniversary of the release of season one but there was a picture of the what a barb scene in there so we mm-hmm. we win some we lose some mm-hmm. and then of course we were also dealing with the potential dark sex plot line that, <laughs> yeah. and the rumored delays that were in the mix So I have to say that fandom morale was feeling pretty low until this day. I woke up to a ton of notifications and basically these screen grabs were circulating on Twitter and it was basically a perfect image of Colin and Penn in costume standing alongside next to each other. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that they'd been shown on a British breakfast show called This Morning and everyone jumped trying to figure out what was going on. I grabbed my laptop, opened ITVX out, tried to figure out what the hell was going on. And so essentially what it was was the show had created a trailer for what was coming up in the next few months. It said coming soon on this morning and it had bits and clips of everything that that we're going to do like future features and Bridgerton featured in this and people thought it was the official launch of promo but I thought it was a really weird way for this to happen like on a British morning show Mm -hmm. where it was just in amongst other things but anyway I videoed it, I screen grabbed what I could and we sat down and poured over the delights. I had a funny feeling about this whole thing because it came out of nowhere, there was no other lead up to it, Yeah, it was so out of left field that I felt pretty certain that this was a leak yeah. and lo and behold I was waiting for morning to hit in LA which is like the Shondaland production Netflix mm-hmm. time zone and as soon as it hit morning on the workday, the program this morning was taken down offline and it was later replaced with an edited version of the episode mm-hmm. where the trailer mm-hmm. was completely cut out yeah <laughs> so by some sort of miraculous divine intervention we had some clips from promo from season three mm-hmm. Uh Beans, where did this morning take us? Right, so we mentioned the This Morning leaks in our recent Block 2 Comes episode. Go listen if you haven't. (laughs) As we said in that episode, a lot of promo was filmed during Block 2. What most likely happened is that the This Morning team filmed the promo, but the footage would have been under an embargo until a specific date to then be released along with the other promo. Mm -hmm. But it seems as though when they were putting together this Coming Soon trailer for the show itself, this footage was accidentally 
accidentally included. Or they accidentally forgot to remove it because they had reconsidered maybe the Bridgerton release date or something. Or, mm-hmm. yeah, that's what I'm thinking. There was a different release date originally. Mm. Whichever it is, we do want to thank whoever it was that saw to it that the footage got in this. <laughs> and we really hope, much like the Netflix Portugal and the Bridgerton Twitter social media managers, we really hope that your jobs are still safe and <laughs> We're manifesting an incredible career for you Mm -hmm. and we're eternally in your debt. Thank you so much. Thank you and apologies. Yes. (laughs) Divine intervention. We hope your career flourishes though. Oh my God, Biscuits just made an entrance. Oh. Hello, darling. Oh, sweetie. Forget the leaks. There she is. Batting your glasses. An angel. But the bag of sweets had exploded on the floor and pollen fans were scrambling all around, picking them up and having the time of our lives enjoying them because lucky, who and what did we see in this video? So in the video, which was presented by the This Morning co-host Alice in Hammond. She was on the set of season three, most notably in the Bridgerton drawing room. We also saw shots of a hair and makeup trailer and what appeared to be the set of a ball. In terms mm-hmm. of the cast, we saw Adjua, Golda, and Claudia all in their season three costumes. And of course, Nicola and Luke, also fully in costume, standing side by side for the very first time. My God. <laughs> do you remember this, kids? Yes. What I do. Yeah. Yeah, my, I literally have texts. I texted my boyfriend and he said that when he saw what I was saying, he he genuinely thought I'd won the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Because that's how <laughs> Yeah. Also shout out to Jack Murphy, he was there as well filming the promo. He did, he did mm-hmm. make a cameo. And I like that Bridgerton, they even include directors, costume designers, the movement director. So Mm -hmm. it's cool that they include Jack Murphy because he does do some really important choreography for the show. Yes, he was dancing with Alison Hammond, who then decided Mm -hmm. to test out her dancing skills on Luke Newton (laughs) by shoving Nicola out of the way in one of the most hilarious clips I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. But if you pause that, like that video of them dancing together is like a three. Yeah. They're in like a little triangle dance. Yeah. 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 For like the split second, if like you can't quite see Alison, and it almost looks like it's pulling dancing just together. Yeah, no. I'm still <laughs> looking forward to a real dance, but yeah, I think I remember pleading with them to release a version where we actually saw Nick and Luke dancing for just a smidgen longer. <laughs> I do think in the trailer, though, they're going to release like a little three second thing of them oh, like I dancing. Will die. I will die. I know. We already know what I'm going to do. <laughs> Shit myself. <laughs> 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 but these things, they were almost like insanely perfect Mm -hmm. because the the framing was gorgeous there was even a mirror behind them not the mirror though the height difference just beautiful it was everything you could have dreamed of but speaking of costuming veg how are they looking oh magnificent and at this point this was the first proper non-blurry look we had of them Mm -hmm. and oh my god Mm -hmm. i screamed you screamed we all screamed for enchanted pollen (laughs) um now they are known as enchanted pollen and for those wondering why Mm -hmm. the look basically really reminded some fans of amy adams and patrick dempsey in the 2007 movie enchanted you know where they're sort of wandering Mm -hmm. through central park and they have that song i think it's the color of pen's dress and obviously her hair but then colin kind of has the same brooding presence as patrick dempsey and before we get bogged down in silly context and things we know now we've made a podcast about silly context babe (laughs) let's describe the look so pen is in a beautiful light aqua colored dress with lovely puffy sleeves and the material of her dress has like a shimmer to it Mm -hmm. when she lifts it up you can see a shimmery gold layer underneath as well and she's got sparkly gold shoes enchanted pen has also decided to pair her ensemble with lilac pajama bottoms (laughs) (laughs) this is more enchanted nick than enchanted pen but yeah this is perhaps for comfort but it's also a sign that she's comfortably enjoying her first love now that (laughs) feelings are being reciprocated there's modern au for you and the shimmery material of the dress also kind of resembles some mm-hmm. of the dresses we later see pen wearing in the window pen and the Osterly still all very much of the same kind of vibe and the dress released by Allure Bridles that was meant to be inspired by pen also has a shimmery underlayer so really interesting to see if this is kind of a design theme throughout the season yeah um, it's possible that the sparkly quality of her dresses is a way to tie into the out of the shadows theme as well as some of the mm-hmm. other themes we've seen in and please let us spiral here the quotes that we've seen in recent journal collections <laughs> so pen <laughs> shines from within but her clothes reflect that she'll be shining outwardly too Aww. her hair is long and loose with wispy curls on her head 
editor's note that I'm recording from a flight. We since found out since recording that these little wispy curls on her head are called kiss curls. Erica Otspis confirmed this. If that is not the perfect next step in Penn's metaphorical hair journey, I don't know what is. Kiss curls, oh my god. But most of the hair is sort of hanging behind with one curl over the shoulder. Is this the one where we think she's got like the little butterfly clips in? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep, butterfly yes. clips, yeah. Gorgeous. Gorgeous, right. Colin, so I think everyone was like going, oh my God, Penn looks so gorgeous. And like, but let's mm-hmm. give some attention to Colin as well. <laughs> he looks great oh, too. Sorry, who's paid her to say that? <laughs> Personal growth. Fucking hell. New year, new you, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so Colin is in a formal jacket. It's sort of little tails. tailcoat theme jiggy. Yeah, jacket mullet. Um, <laughs> he's got a waistcoat as well. Yes, oh. a cravat, and it's a high necked one mm. at that. But I think on this magical day, we were so excited to get this crumb that not even the free the net campaigners could be upset here. Like we're fine with it. I wasn't mad at the cravat. I will say that it's all right. Yeah. I'm just saying I love a jawline and his jawline still shines through. True, true, true. That is true. Um, So his hair's combed to one side and his sideburns are sideburning. Mm -hmm. Earlier, I couldn't remember the word for sideburn, so I pointed to my boyfriend's face. I said, what's that? (laughs) 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 Um, So what struck us at the time, and again, Mm -hmm. who cares about context? What struck us at the time is that the colour of Colin's waistcoat seemed to match Penn's dress, and honestly, this sent us all into a spiral this is it we thought this is their engagement ball they're going matchy matchy they're in love this is amazing it was a lot i didn't think it was their engagement i thought it was tragic matching on part. but you you know you go with your romance i was thinking today when i was listening back to our episode like we always say that colin loves love obs hates love (laughs) i don't know why i (laughs) here with the podcast about a romance show i find love appalling she says that but that is not true it is a that is not it's a trick i want you to be in love if it happened to me i would scream never again we'll get you on the app lies and deceit i I hope you get your happily ever after obviously no no (laughs) well anyway anyway and you know speaking of speaking of ruining people's days speaking of this couple who are in love so we've been to ostley now we've had our ostley we've had our christmas day still extravaganza what are you gonna say and we've seen the promo shots so now we're fairly convinced that these were the costumes that Penn and colin were wearing in other scenes earlier that they then put mm-hmm. back on to do the promo rather yeah. than it being yeah. like the this morning crew bumping into the mid scene or something like that because we right. really think that colin's outfit is the same as the ostley one minus his bandage his hand is intact yeah he also doesn't have the bandage so you can tell that it wasn't that day it wasn't because i think I, they just like let's put them in some representation sensitive outfits Mm. editor's note since recording this episode luke newton has mentioned that in season three they had a wardrobe for colin where he and the team were able to pick and choose pieces to create looks for colin basically on the day of shooting so there is a possibility that colin our ever sustainable king may rewear some items throughout the season what does this mean for enchanted pollen and for obs who is still grieving enchanted pollen it means there is a chance that enchanted pollen is still a thing it is possible that colin rewears his australia outfit for whatever scene enchanted pen features in, they would still match and we would still have Colin accidentally matching Penelope before they get together. Especially if, as Luke stated, they tried to make costuming choices that reflected Penelope and the Pollen relationship in some way. We will definitely be keeping an eye out for Enchanted Pollen in trailers and stills to see if we can get a read on this. That being said, sorry if I'm getting into the weeds here, but this also kind of calls into question his Unicolin waistcoat, which he wears in both the Unicolin and Moonlight Pollen scenes. I still believe these scenes take place in the same day because I think it would be odd for Colin to rewear the same waistcoat coat across multiple days in the same episode unless he's just like a besotted wreck and has stopped bathing but those are my two cents um, and we're not super sure on pens but it's not that same ostley moon ball scene but we did see this hair look back in block two so that yeah. suggests it was also mm-hmm. around that time yeah oh we live to clown another day but obviously that was disappointing but Still a yeah. great little outfit from them both. Yeah. So we don't think this is an engaged pollen. We think this is right. from earlier in the no. season. But potentially we may see married pollen this episode. So mm. that might make up for it. Ooh. Well, fingers crossed. Let's wait for that bus to turn up. Editors note, dear listeners, married pollen are on their way, but we actually will discuss them in our next episode. Apologies. I think this has made my favorite pen look of season three so far. Mm. It, it's definitely yeah. my favorite. I, I do love the window pen. I will say that. Mm. But there is just something about this memory that will always live on yeah 
and she yeah. just looks ethereal. Yeah. Do you know yes. what I mean? But this one, she just kind of looks like soft and like mermaidy and ethereal yeah. and beautiful, and I love it. And her hair is pulled up in such a romantic way. Yeah. Also, I will say, up until then, all we have seen are the reduce, reuse, recycle. That's true. Dress. Yes. Yeah. This is our first new and one. Glorious yeah. blur of blue that yeah. was like yeah. maybe that's glowed up pen, mm-hmm. but yeah. this was like high definition. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, oh, one thing I will say about this though is that the photos that circulate quite often have been edited to be lightened so you can see them more clearly. Yes. So it gives off a weird colouring, right. especially to Penelope's hair. Yeah. She hasn't like changed her hair colour. But this was our very first non-blurry season three pollen. Like you say, beans, not a reduce, reuse, recycle either. Yeah. And they were standing together, no less. Yeah. Now, Beans, where are Enchanted Pen and Colin hanging out together? Okay. Pen and Colin are in a, the very familiar location of the Bridgerton drawing room. Mm-hmm. The mirror that's behind them in the video has always been there. It's not <laughs> symbolic, babes. <laughs> I feel like we get a stand down mirror fans every episode so far. <laughs> <laughs> You've had your mirror. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but we were all excited to see them framed with it nonetheless. However, although we have spent many a happy afternoon in the Bridgerton drawing room, fans spotted a brand new addition Mm -hmm. to the set in the shape of a portrait of Violet and Edmund hanging over the fireplace. Now, whatever could that mean, Lecky? This was so exciting. So Pollen fans had wondered for a while if there would be some kind of Edmund and Violet parallel for Pollen in season three. Book fans, you'll know that there are definitely similarities between book Vilemond. Are we saying Vilemond? I don't know what their name is. What? B- what? No, I'm not on board with Vileman. Oh, Vileman? Thank you. Edmit, maybe? Edmit. Edmit sounds like Egyptian. How are you saying Edmit is better? Edmit. Edmolet? Edliot. Legerton. Legerton. Let's just say Violet and Edmund. Okay, so uh, apologies, but book fans, you will know that there are definitely similarities <laughs> between what? book Violet and Edmund and show Pollen, Ugh. and it would be a really beautiful addition to Pollen's story if that parallel was explored in season three. So seeing a portrait of them together in such a prominent position made us all think that this might actually happen. Editor's note, since we recorded this episode, we of course have received the lessons scene. If you listen to our Remarkable Shade of Blue episode, you'll know we are also super excited to see the portrait frame centrally within that scene, adding to our belief or delusional hope that the Penn, Colin, Edmund, and Violet parallel will in fact be a part of season three. Okay, why don't we take the end of their names? Mudlet. Mudlet. Like mullet? <laughs> Mudlet. 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 We'll go with Mudlet. None of these are appealing. I'm down for it. <laughs> Mudlet till the end. <sighs> you know, it's no better than Greasy, let's be honest. Mm. Mudlet. Yeah, that's pretty unfortunate. I will say, we have since seen this portrait appear in Queen Charlotte, but in Queen Charlotte, it was never focused on. It's like a focal... They never had a scene where they addressed it or anything like that. It was never particularly framed. So we think that it was included as a conscious decision for season three, uh-huh. as opposed to Queen Charlotte. Veg, how are Mudlet looking? The couple in question... <laughs> <laughs> may be made of oil paints, but they are otherwise bearing a striking resemblance to season three, Pen and Colin, Yay. which oh. only intensified our clowning about a possible parallel. And painting Edmund is dressed very similarly to Colin, even down to the flouncy cravat, whilst painted Violet is wearing a delicate blue dress with her hair loose, very much like the pen we've seen so far. And if that wasn't enough, Violet also has a yellow throw draped across her. Yellow people. I do think maybe it has a parallel to Colin and Penn, but we know that Violet's going to have a significant story this mm-hmm. season as well. So I'm wondering if they partially did that so that she can like stare at her portrait of her and oh, her husband. Oh no, how depressing. And she'll take it down and gently turn it upside down when she's plowing yeah. Marcus. <laughs> Like that sad conversation she has with Lady Danbury about whether or not to take down the birthday hats? No. Oh, no oh I thought you were going to say that conversation she had where she was going to ask a footman to lie on top of her. <laughs> I, I said sad conversation. I, did, I didn't say... I mean, that doesn't make me feel happy. <laughs> so I don't know what the emotion is. It might just have multiple meanings this season, like a love for Penn and Colin, Cantony, but also Violet looking at her past and being like, is it okay for me to move on, Edmund? But still have you in my heart. (laughs) 
Yeah. No, I that, I agree. This is something that Ruth Gemmel mentioned in the recent Shondaland article. Mm-hmm. She said that seeing her children in various stages of love yes. made her reflect on and made her really miss Edmund. So it could be a combination of all of like seeing the new Viscount Viscountess together. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Seeing Pollen, seeing Fron, mm-hmm. seeing her own way through the world. Mm-hmm. It all kind of intermingles. But from a Pollen perspective, do you think we might get a moment between Pollen and Violet where maybe Pollen are in a bit of a difficult position? Yes. And and I hope so. they have a moment in front of the portrait. Or is that too similar to the Greg scene in 208? Oh, I don't know if they'll have a scene in front of the portrait. Where they actually directly are like, that's you, dad, that's me. I don't know about that. But I, I do hope that she addresses, you know, that comment she made in season one about how you should marry your best friend. And like yeah. the best foundation for a marriage mm-hmm. could be friendship. That kind of theme. And I think also like with Violet rediscovering love herself, potentially, it could be mm-hmm. just just a transformative conversation for both her and Colin. Yeah. Like she can talk about oh, yeah. different types of love and how potentially her and Marcus can also be very good friends as well if they are falling in love and how you can create friendships within love and things like that. Yeah. So maybe. Maybe it's a moment where Penn's going to get executed <laughs> and she's like, don't worry, Colin, you'll find love again. <laughs> Meanwhile, Fran's listening with an ear out to the conversation. Dear God. I heard Cressida's still available. <laughs> Oh, gosh. <laughs> We're all getting thrown off our own podcast through <laughs> this conversation. Oh, dear. Beans, where else? What we've seen is that you've ruined the portrait for me now. Where else are you going to take us? I didn't ruin it. I brought it back. I will say there are similarities to Pollen. It's so glaring. Yeah. I mean, it could just be my yeah. little Pollen heart reading into it, but they just right. look so similar. And uh, I just really hope mm. there is like a parallel. Like I said, I think there are going to be parallels, of mm. obviously, because mm-hmm. their story matches with Edmund and Mudlitz. <laughs> their story matches with Mudlitz. We're all shaking our heads. But I also think that I like to push back on things. I'm being a little bit of a contrarian. <laughs> you can be the contrarian. That's fine. So, aside from the Bridgerton drawing room set, Allison also went to the set of a ball. Mm -hmm. We haven't yet figured out if this is a real location or if this is one of the hand-built sets over at Uxbridge. I believe it was an Uxbridge set. I do too. The floor looks like, it doesn't look like a real floor. It looks like a floor they made. Well, not just that, the ceiling doesn't look like it's low, you know? Yeah, 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 that's a good point. But I think you might be right. Lecky, what is this ball looking like though? This ball looks to be very deeply red in its deck decorations and also features broken and full Grecian columns, which is interesting. This kind of mm-hmm. makes sense to us because if we look at the costume Adjua is wearing in these clips, she seems to be carrying through with this kind of like Grecian theme. She's wearing a golden hairpiece with a Grecian leaf design. Yes. There is also a royal footman on the set of the ball, which makes us suspect this could be a ball hosted by the queen, perhaps. Remember, this would have been Mm -hmm. filmed all the way back in block two, so this is a ball most likely taking place in either episode three or four. Yep. Oh, little Colin losing pen, thinking she's going to be with someone else, and the smashed Greek columns everywhere. (laughs) Tragic. And those were the This Morning Leagues. Mm -hmm. I mean, probably the best thing that's ever happened to us, Mm -hmm. I would argue. They saw us through the darkest days. They were truly the lighthouse Mm -hmm. in the storm. Yep. Pollen together. It was gorgeous heartbreaking now that we think they don't actually match but you know we love them nonetheless yeah most importantly do you think we actually ever will get this promo no i don't i do no i don't can't but i will Mm. say i think that like this particular leak was so important because those days were less than crumbs it was dust i was yeah like we weren't getting a lot had nothing Mm -hmm. yeah yeah Yeah. and we really thought we were going to get a sneak peek at christmas and i think like i say morale was low yeah in our to doom episode veg said something like pirate colin saw us through the the winter enchanted Mm. Colin saw us through Through the the following year yeah yeah (laughs) Yeah, sure (laughs) it was the real hair of 2023 you know yeah Yeah. for sure i think we will get it at some point i remain hopeful beans we were all still floating in the sky after this morning leaks but then on the 13th of january luke shared a photo to instagram stories what on earth was going on all right so this photo showed luke's place at a table read there was his name card a microphone carefully covered up scripts and across the other side of the room you could see an empty row of seats waiting for other cast members to come in if you don't know what a table read is it's basically one of the last stages of pre-production where cast the directors producers heads of the department 
department, etc. will come together for a final run through ahead of filming. It's an opportunity to finalize plans and details and also give the writing team a chance to figure out if last minute adjustments need to be made. Mm -hmm. Because of the timing of this photo, we're pretty sure that this was the block four table read. So mm -hmm. going through episode seven and eight, just before filming began, Luke also previously shared a photo from the final read through of season two. So it was a continuation of this little tradition. Oh, thank you, Luke. I remember at the time we all flipped out when we saw this because we'd misjudged the blocks. Yeah. Yeah. And we thought that they were a lot further along in filming than they yes. actually were. Yeah. And we thought they were going to be tidying up really quickly yeah. after the new year. This also fueled the like rumor that there were rewrites and everything but i want to stress mm -hmm. this again it's been denied there has been no proof of it ever coming out both people who worked mm -hmm. on the show and other independent sources that are a part of the show have said that there was no dark sex plot line <laughs> <laughs> just keep in mind they they took off like four weeks maybe even longer yeah. than four weeks for christmas i think it was actually longer than a month um, before yeah. they started filming again and also i think we may have mentioned it in block one but the way that they handed out the scripts for season two and season three were different and season yeah. one they mm -hmm. had all the scripts at the same time mm -hmm. so they did a read yeah. for the entire time in season two they were given the scripts but for each block so the two episodes that they mm -hmm. were filming for each block so it was mm -hmm. a little bit different and they probably had read-throughs for every block yeah so as i said this really forces have a massive a re evaluation of when filming might end and when the show would be released we didn't need to worry about that as it turned out <laughs> but it also confirmed that everything that happened before the christmas break had been contained to block three mm -hmm. So we'd thought at the time that maybe the mirror scene was happening in block four yeah. towards the end of the season. Yeah. But when we realised that that would have been block three, it really like changed our idea of the story. And mm -hmm. at the time we thought that the mirror scene being in episode five or six would be really early. Yeah. So we were so hyped by that. Mm -hmm. Embarrassingly, we also spent a lot of time squinting at the names on the other side of the room. <laughs> but unfortunately, they were just too far away for us to be able to make out any of the cast and character names. Always clan and eight. <laughs> but that was a sign that filming in block four would be kicking off any day soon. And sure enough, beans, grab the soap. Lucky, get the sponge. Veg, make sure the towels are on hand because it's time for us to take a bath. I mean, I think we just gave that away quite blatantly. But beans, where are you taking us now? We're going on a whirlwind tour. What a surprise. We're off to Bath. Bath? is a city in England that's also a UNESCO World Heritage Site thanks to its many historic buildings and landmarks. I didn't write this, but thank you. <laughs> but thank you for including this. Are you getting paid by the tourism board? <laughs> Especially the Roman baths for which the town is named after and many, many, many Georgian buildings. It's also the home of Francesca Bridgerton, who spends more time there than anywhere else it feels like. Yeah, get bloody back from bath mm -hmm. veg you're no stranger to greenwich and you're no stranger to bath either although sorry i'm speaking to someone from the south of bath oh yeah sorry yes i actually lived in bath and i know it seems odd that i lived in bath and i now live in greenwich but i just want to say this was pre-bridgerton and i'm not a crazy person <laughs> <laughs> it's also coincidence that i've spent a lot of time traveling in greece <laughs> yeah. and i mean that genuinely <laughs> Uh, but yeah, Bath was used all the time. When I lived there, they filmed like Sherlock. They did old timey Christmas special or something for Sherlock. They filmed that there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anything. Basically, if you watch a TV show in England and they're on an old street, chances are it's in Greenwich or Bath. Like, yeah. <laughs> Beans, has the show been there before? Yeah, yeah, it sure has. So both Bridgerton and Queen Charlotte have used the city across all seasons of the shows. A lot of the establishing shots of the Tawn are filmed in Bath. Royal Crescent is often seen when carriages are riding through the Tawn. The Modiste mm -hmm. shop is based on a real shop in the city. And of course, the Holborn Museum doubles as Lady Dan Danbury's home and number one Royal Crescent is used as the exterior of the Featherington home. I will add that the Modiste shop is a sandwich shop as well <laughs> like it's a real sandwich shop <laughs> and they have the wisteria now in the windows that you can like go and and eat there. So production picked back up in Bath in mid-January and they were there for around about a week filming across the Royal mm -hmm. Crescent, the Holborn Museum, and specific streets in the city that were closed off to traffic and set to look like Regency London thanks to a bunch of gravel that was being poured on the tarmac. 
buildings were covered or dressed, flowers and greenery was also added in. I should mention that by and large, most of what was filmed in Bath at this time were pickups specifically for what looks like to be episode one of season three. People were very confused about the dress that she was wearing, especially yeah. after okay. seeing Enchanted Pollen. Yeah. And I remember having to explain this across multiple crumbs posts that no, in <laughs> fact, they this was probably the only time that they could film in Bath so they had to film yes. everything mm-hmm. for the season in this particular week. Because Queen Charlotte was filming in Bath when they originally scheduled to film there. Yes. In the summer. Exactly. Things that moved around. Right. So it caused a lot of confusion at the time. But yeah, so they filmed everything they needed for season three was filmed in that week. Yeah. Episode one through eight. So there you go. Because it's a lot of establishing shots, right? And stuff like that. So it appears throughout the whole season. Yep. Yeah, like carriages, paper boys running around, that sort of stuff. Exactly, yeah. Debutantes, things like mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Lucky, speaking of. Yes, so early in the week, production was busy setting up all over Bath, where it was freezing cold, mm-hmm. by the way. Yeah. And over at the Holborn Museum, fans and passersby noticed that the exterior had been decorated with flowers, the color scheme of which has mystified us for some time. Very strange collection of flowers. Reds and oranges, okay. yeah. But no, and then there's also purple and white. And then the first the first bouquet is almost citrus feathering tongue colors. There's yellow and orange. It, it's a very, very weird collection of flowers. All the subplots happen yeah, yeah, together. Yeah. 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 Editor note interestingly you can see some of these flowers in the goodnight mr bridgerton scene that we just received specifically the pinkish ones we will be discussing this scene a bit more later but we were especially intrigued when fans reported that a carriage was delivered outside the property that is used as the exterior of the featherington house but some great crumbs arose from this as footage poured in across social media from fans passersby and paparazzi clear footage thanks (laughs) the heavens one of the things we saw was a lineup of carriages including the featherington carriage as well as antony lady Danbury and Collins carriages. There are many mm-hmm. others as well, but we'll revisit Collins carriage as well as the Featherington carriage because they popped up again in a big way. Absolutely. And earlier in the week, many tons of people were spotted filming. We'll say that Bath is very accessible for passersby and photographers alike, even with the street closures. So there were tons of leaks that were coming in from this week, including some gorgeous high quality shots of Penelope. And one of the tons of people was even wearing an old mm-hmm. violet dress. So keeping going our daily love mantra beans. Reduce, reuse, recycle. I also want to shout out <laughs> Uh, what is that photographer's name? Jamie Bellinger. Jamie Bellinger. I still follow him. Go follow him. He creates some beautiful like art and he talks a lot about like social issues in the UK and stuff like that. He's fantastic, mm-hmm. but he was our savior. <laughs> so yeah. he took so many photos that we'll share. Yeah. So on day two of filming in Bath, there were lots of establishing shots being filmed, as we said. The kind of quick clips that we see as, you know, tons of people walk around through the town, they leave their homes and they get papers delivered to them, carriages riding through the streets, things like that. But that day, there was some very exciting film going on over at number one, Royal Crescent, aka the exterior of the Featherington House. Lecky, what was going down over there? Well, thanks to some very dedicated Bridgerton fans, some bewildered passersby, and a number of interested local photographers and neighbors. There was a lady right next door who, like, I guess she lived next door yeah. to number one, yeah. Royal Crescent, so she just stepped outside, <laughs> took some great photos. <laughs> she is absolutely loaded. Imagine. But we got a great look at the filming that was taking place. There were horses and extras on set, as well as a couple of writers who were posting from the Royal Crescent. But Pollen fans were so excited when Nicola Coughlin arrived on set with Polly Walker and filmed what appears Mm. to be the Featherington's arrival back in Mayfair from what we strongly suspect to be the opening scenes of episode one. Mm -hmm. Throwing you into the carriage here. (laughs) Yeah. So in this scene, we kind of see this carriage arrive and it's like laden down with luggage, which kind of supports the idea that they're just returning to Mayfair. We see Portia and Penelope getting out of the carriage. Portia kind of has like this beaming triumphant expression. And interestingly, Penelope is also beaming. She looks very like happy to be back in Mayfair. She might have like kind of a plan in mind. Who knows? On the steps, we also saw the Featherington staff waiting to greet them, including Rosa Hesmanholsh, who we believe to be Penelope's new lady's maid. She's standing just by Mm -hmm. Varley. So Portia ends up going up the stairs, but Penelope kind of hesitates and she looks up at the Featherington house and she has this beaming smile. Behind her, we see this extra who's dressed in Colin's baby blue jacket holding an issue of Lady Whistledown. It's such a great shot, but yeah, it seems like all of the townspeople around her are reading the first issue of Lady Whistledowns. I think we'll probably hear some voiceover over this scene. It looks mm-hmm. like one of the opening scenes of episode one. Yeah. Veg, how are the Featheringtons looking? Oh, so Bath Pen caused quite the splash and a lot of questing on 
blow up when we saw her. Her hair being the main culprit here because it was full poodle piled on top of her head. <laughs> her dress is one we've also seen before during the cake scene of 102. Beans. Readers! Readers! Recycle! <laughs> <laughs> You're like a boxing <laughs> announcement there. <laughs> In this corner, reduce, reuse, recycle. <laughs> In the other corner, glow up. <laughs> so this dress wasn't yellow. There's that, I guess. But I guess it was a more of a yellowy hue than blue. And also there were some new to us blue flowers over the dress, including a very mm-hmm. big one. <laughs> <laughs> And so in vibes, this is definitely a season one pen dress, which some of us reasoned maybe because she was with Portia, she was like under her thumb. Yeah, Portia's control over her wardrobe. Yeah, we know know she doesn't start dressing for herself initially. And as Mm -hmm. Beans explained, this isn't going to be an episode seven or eight look. So like, I mean, in theory, it could be part of a flashback, but more likely it was part of pickups for an earlier episode. Pen's hair is also styled very similarly to Portia's in this scene. They both Mm -hmm. have very tight curls, which again, visually can is that Penn is again trapped under her mother's thumb. I was also thinking about why they included this specific dress, the mm-hmm. cake dress from 102 where Penelope is talking to Marina about sex. During our 102 rewatch, we also talked about how the costuming really reflected Penelope's naivety in that scene. It's also interesting that all the reused costumes Penn wears in episode one seem to be from season one. This not only suggests that Penn regressed during the off season, but these dresses will provide a starker contrast to the far more mature looks she'll move into once back in London. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So Paul Portia as well is in every used dress. Reduce, reuse, recycle. Seen a few <laughs> times, but most notably in the Queen's Luncheon in season one. And mm-hmm. she's seen here though with a new green fur lined fro to keep her warm. And she's also mm-hmm. holding an eye mask, suggesting they were maybe arriving back home after like a long carriage ride or something. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Portia's throw did strike me a bit. Like, and some of the other characters around are dressed, suggesting it might be like a winter scene. Mm. And we know that the marriage smart season takes place throughout spring and summer. So it seems unusual, but I would love to discuss. It is possible that season three takes place later in the year. Colin does say in 301 that Penn didn't write to him over the summer. But both debuts in season one and season two took place in April of each year. So our Mm -hmm. bet at the moment is that season three also begins the same way. Mm -hmm. I think it's a case that it was fucking freezing in Bath. Poor Nick had her arms out, but I think the costuming team were doing their best because they would have known that they were going to be filming over the winter. We're doing their best to make them as warm as they could be. Yeah, we'll we'll discuss this later, but the debutantes who were seen later, they were holding like red shawls over them. When it came time for them to actually film for the scene, those red shawls were removed. They were probably just to keep them warm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think we have our opening scene of Penelope arriving back in London. That's definitely the train that I'm on. I think it contextually makes a lot more sense. Portia's been on a long ride, so she She's been asleep, whereas Penelope has been ready to get back to London. Lucky, you mentioned the expression on mm-hmm. Penn's face. And I have to say, I know that the dress is not a glowed yeah. up dress, but these are some of my favourite yeah, photos yeah. of Penelope mm-hmm. I think we've ever seen. There's just something, and the photographer has captured them very well and that might not be the perspective we get in the mm-hmm. show it's just the set leaks but because when I'd imagine Penelope arriving back in London and especially arriving back to her house you think this is a scene where she kind of lost everything at the end of last scene like yeah, that all happened at her house and I always wondered like how she'd feel and I always imagined that she might be Nicola would call mm-hmm. bitter whether she'd be like sad to come back to the scene mm-hmm. and yeah. instead of what you have which you know what is so true to her character mm-hmm. we should never underestimate her is this triumphant moment yeah. where it looks as though she has timed it it looks as if she's timed yeah. it perfectly so the issue Whistledown arrives the exact same second she arrives Mm -hmm. in town so she somehow organised that ahead of her arrival and it's this moment where it reveals a bit about her mindset because she has a plan in mind we all know that that's kind of the direction it's going in but it's this moment where it's kind of like the bad bitch of Mayfair is back Mm -hmm. and she's a girl on a mission a woman with a plan and I just love it and then obviously to see Rosa as the maid we're hoping that she's going to be like a close confidant it's interesting going back and seeing these bath photos because I feel like after we saw them and we saw Rosa, Mm -hmm. we Mm -hmm. then went back to other filming leaks that we got and we found her old royal naval college yeah yeah but also we said that both Penn and Portia are wearing all costuming there's been a lot of discussion as to whether that's intentional or not whether the Featheringtons are pretending to have money yeah. but they secretly don't have any money after everything with Jack and they're re-wearing old clothing but kind of embellished a little bit but I wonder if potentially what's happened we've seen in other leaks that Penelope is wearing old costuming again I just wonder if the costuming team were making life easy for themselves and just reusing old costumes for scenes like this. 
I mean, it could be, but I also feel like it's in line with their characters to reuse dresses. We've seen them do that throughout both seasons. It yeah. makes sense in terms of them kind of always constantly struggling with money. And even if yeah. you were able to keep some of the money that Jack basically swindled from the Tom, they don't necessarily yeah. want to show that off to people. That's what I was going to say. And that doesn't necessarily mean that money is going to last them a long time either. Maybe Portia is kind of saving their money yeah. for dresses for prudence to try to find her a husband or something. Yeah. You know. Because in 208, Portia said that the Ton would also be told that Portia had invested all their money in yeah. too, so they technically shouldn't have too much yeah. Yeah. knocking around. But they do have new staff. Yeah, I think that Portia is playing the long game with this mm-hmm. one. She's going to be yeah. like, mm-hmm. okay, because she needs money for a dowry for Prudence. Yeah. She's going to need money for new dresses and things like that. But if she gets all of these all at once, people are going to be like, huh. Yeah. So yeah. I thought that you guys were struggling. Yeah, where, where is this coming from? Also, she could be picking and choosing her moment. Like, there's no need for them to arrive in, in the town wearing new dresses, especially if no one was really going to see them yeah. except for their staff. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. I will say that Prudence wasn't spotted mm-hmm. in the filming yeah. here, but it doesn't mean she wasn't yeah. there. Editor's note, hold that thought, Obs. It was notable at the time that Bessie Carter wasn't spotted on set during this scene. At the time, we wondered if she just wasn't seen by those on the ground. But since Valentine's Day and that sneak peek at Prudence in episode one, one, we're wondering if Prudence begins the season already married, hence explaining why Bessie was not on set for the Featherington arrival. And if she is married, will Prudence and Dankworth live at the Featherington house? We're sure Penn would be thrilled if that were the case. But yeah, it was a gorgeous scene to see Penelope arrive back in this moment of triumph <laughs> before she fails spectacularly and we all want to cry. Filming continued the next day over on Edwards and Great Pulteney Street. So filming was taking place showing paperboys handing out Lady Whistledown issues to passers-by. There were tons of people strolling along the street. Also, a note that one of the buildings on the street is a hotel called Duke's Hotel. We believe that this was used as a hair and makeup base. So the inside was used by the crew. Again, it was so cold and it was just somewhere for them to have their base. But the exterior of the hotel was dressed to look like Regency yeah. England. And this pops up in some of the photos. Yeah. And you can see it in the leaks of the Lady Whistledown issues being delivered. Sadly, we could not read the issues of Lady Whistledown, though we valiantly tried to zoom in as best we could. We're not sure which episode this was for either. It could be for episode one, like a continuation of the scene Mm -hmm. where we saw Penn arrive home as her first edition of Lady Whistledown is being delivered. And it could also be a scene from a later episode, one of the many shots where we see taunts people receiving new issues of the scandal sheet. And what else did we see, Lecky? Debutantes. Lots and lots of debutantes. We think they probably filmed like establishing shots of debutantes leaving their homes and getting in carriages for their presentation. Although, fans have a theory about this, right? Yes, one of our friends had the great theory that this scene where the debutantes are kind of hurriedly leaving their houses, getting ready for the presentation, a scene that we've seen similarly at the beginning of the seasons, yeah. but this is going to play out during the Lady Mistledown voiceover that we heard at Dumb 2022, mm-hmm. specifically across the lines, Lady Veg, come out of retirement, babe, we need you. <laughs> As the season begins, the question on everyone's mind is, of course, which newly minted debutante will shine the brightest? The crop this year appears to be rather dazzling indeed. And there's a theory too that this is going to be interspersed with the scene of Penelope mm. arriving because we know that that Lady Whistledown continues to be quite disparaging. Not every young lady can attract the light. Mm. And so people have speculated that that scene, that that line will play as Penelope gets out of her house. Although I do think that Penn's arrival as a romantic lead might be better as an actual scene itself. And I think we saw from some of the set leaks that Penelope and Portia have like a little quip back and yeah. forth. Yeah. I think Portia's like, hurry, book up, Penn. <laughs> yeah. So I think maybe their arrival will be more of a moment if she actually arrives and we see that properly yeah. although my other theory about the debutantes is that imagine that the debutantes all hurriedly kind of leaving their houses trying to get to the presentational time and imagine if colin is riding through on mm-hmm. a horse desperately trying to make it back to bridgerton house to see fran before she leaves which ties into what we saw at the rangers leaks where colin seems to arrive just as the bridgertons are leaving their houses so that's how i'd like it personally there were people who suspected they saw a colin double yeah Yes. standing outside the Featherington house but that same extra was seen riding through the town on a, on a horse but he didn't look like a pirate but it, it wasn't William Fiorello who we know is Luke Standen I don't think but um, mm. potentially maybe he has the second devil and that was the Colin riding through the town I don't know that could be funny okay I got a little tingle in my nipples but um <laughs> what's the opposite of a pickle I don't know <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what is the opposite of a pickle pickle jaw my, my oyster started shivering Oh, no. <laughs> no, don't like that. Tell it to clam up, please. <laughs> 
get the pearl back in the shell. Oh dear. Editor's note, since recording, we've gone back and re-examined these pictures, and in the original photograph snapped by a passerby, they added the text, quote, I don't watch it, I'm afraid, meaning Bridgerton, but this is the lead guy's double who does the horse riding scenes. This is compelling to me in retrospect because I don't think someone who doesn't watch the show would infer that this was a double. I think the actor told him directly, and this makes me think that Luke has a double specifically for horse riding along with his normal stand-in, who we just mentioned. Now, the pants that the actor is wearing in the scene where he is sitting down don't seem to be a match for Pirate Collins, but he is wearing a brown coat in both this picture as well as the one that Jamie Bellinger snapped of him riding down a street in Bath. And it's possible that he may have filmed multiple scenes of Colin riding on horseback as well since they were doing pickups at the time. So in some, we may see some scenes of Colin riding this season, and there is some hope that we could see him riding home in his pirate getup as Ob's speculated. I should also add, as this came as a little bit of a shock to Ob's, that the double is wearing a brown top hat. So if you need some time to wrap your head around the idea of our gentleman pirate with the top hat, please take the time to do so. I'm taking this from your idea, Ob's, your idea about Colin riding on a horse. <laughs> oh my god. Um, <laughs> idea that this could be the opening scene. Actually, that could all fit in. Like, Colin yeah. rushing home, the Bridgerton's getting Fran ready, mm -hmm. and we hear Lady Whistle down over all of this and then it'll cut to what we said previously where everyone's like looking for Fran right mm -hmm. and then she's just like I'm yeah. right here and yeah. then it cuts to Penn coming up the stairs and like the yeah. final words from Lady Whistledown are said and then we shoot back to the Bridgertons coming outside and Collins coming up. That's a good point because there are pauses in the Lady Whistledown voiceover as yeah. certain things happen and then it'll mm -hmm. pick back up as she continues her narration. Exactly. I think that'd be a fantastic opening scene like very chaotic which is what we love to see <laughs> which is what happens at the beginning of every season like we yeah. had Daphne's and then Eloisa's and now we're gonna have Fran's that would be a fun little opening scene I wonder if we'll see Penelope go inside and then they're in the Featherington drawing room where she usually is like peering out of the window yeah and as Colin mm -hmm. arrives home but if we see her maybe turn away as he arrives home or something like that yeah, yeah. something like that I yeah like I don't want to see that bitch I feel like <laughs> it's uh, it's gonna be basically bringing together Penn and Colin so we realize that they're the main leads even though we already know yeah but like yeah. you know when Colin gets home and Penn goes inside Colin's like pulling up on his <laughs> maybe that's what he's looking at yeah and he like sees her go inside or he sees I think she's gonna be inside by the time he arrives do you think she's gonna be at the window yeah and it sets the two leads exactly where we physically need them to be exactly mm. and then Eloise is like who cares if Pat is back but <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like we have a very like good idea of what that opening sequence is going to be like just from all these yeah. leaks but yeah yeah which is why I want them to release it because it's like we've kind of almost seen <laughs> yeah. it now let us just see the physical clip so we say and then watch it not be that at all but <laughs> it seems like because they've done the debutante thing before yeah. that they're gonna kind of yeah. they like keep with certain traditions you yeah. know ain't gonna next season uh, when there's no Bridget and Daughter yeah. to present <laughs> but speaking of our favorite pirate were there any sightings of a brown jacketed, red gloved leading man? You said we might have seen a double, but we want the real thing, thank you. No fake rubies around here. Funnily enough, there was a passerby just so happened to take a photo of Luke Newton entering Duke's Hotel, which we believe was the hair and makeup station. He was wearing a hair clip, <laughs> but he wasn't in costume. So we got a little glimpse of a, a Colin curl, but that was about it. Yeah, we'll see the hair clip again. And that was, oh, that was such a chance encounter. Like had that passerby not been there and not snapped that photo we would have had no idea no it was like even yep. filming yep. Yeah. in bath mm -hmm. and it really goes to show that all of these crumbs that we have are literally like the tiniest drop in the ocean yeah. and the mm -hmm. one photo can change our perception of what and who is being filmed and that's mm -hmm. and i would say that for everybody like yeah. you know a yeah. lot of people were concerned that jonathan bailey wasn't going to be in this season but mm -hmm. like we know yeah. he was coming back and forth like every yeah, two yeah, yeah. weeks and we also know that they had long film filming days especially at the end when Jonathan mm. Bailey yeah. had free time at that point so mm. it's just like we we don't truly know because there's so much secrecy behind filming yeah and this is going to be pertinent to a later scene when Eloise might not be at a certain a certain location yeah. 
but luckily back in Bath, more filming was taking place that night, I think. Yes, excitingly, there were also reports of possible night shoots. Residents snapped photos of filming Mm -hmm. taking place at the Holborn Museum. A big barrier had been erected to prevent people from seeing into the courtyard on the ground floor, but we could see lights aimed at the courtyard and at the balcony on the exterior of what is Lady Danbury's house in the show. And we also saw some extras on the balcony. Mm -hmm. We don't think it was any of the principal cast, but I remember at the time that we may have had a debate about why the actors would be filmed on the balcony at Lady Danbury's. We think this is Lady Danbury's first ball of the season, and we speculated that the actors on the balcony could perhaps be having a conversation about something that is happening at that point in the story. That's one option, but I I like this one better. I have a hunch that they were shooting a scene in the courtyard below, especially because they directed that barrier. (laughs) Editor's note. So I'm recording this editor's note on the 15th of February, and as you guys will know, on the 14th, we got a clip that we believe was the clip that they were filming. You'll hear us discuss other theories and I've kept it in because it shows that we're not always right and we're often wrong about this stuff. So listen, enjoy, but we are wrong and we are clowns. Editor's note to the editor's note, I, Lucky, just have to add that I was right, however, that they were filming in the courtyard at Holborn as the goodnight Mr. Bridgerton scene takes place there, but I didn't get the details quite right. Yeah. And because we saw that the courtyard was lit up and either there is tension because there's a chance that whoever is in the courtyard could be spotted or heard by the people above them on the balcony or the people on the balcony may actually witness something that takes place Ooh. in the courtyard, maybe a little scandalous moment between Penn and Colin. Well, it was definitely confirmed that it was filmed at night because there were locals who took pictures and it's nighttime. We have pictures. We'll share them. Mm-hmm. Back over at Penelope's house on the Royal Crescent, photographs from locals also showed that certain carriages had been left out overnight. Yeah. It was extremely extremely cold in Bath and we have a beautiful photo that someone took of Colin's dark blue carriage looking particularly chilly. There was also another black carriage and obviously I think you have a theory about that one, don't you? I do, I do. I have a little theory. So it looked as if that these carriages, like you say, had been left out overnight, but it could also have been that filming was taking place overnight because the passerby just took it very early in the morning. And the two carriages, like you say, we've got Colin's carriage, we can see the crest, it's definitely his. But the other carriage looks very like a hired hack. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, can anyone think of a scene that would involve a hired <laughs> hack and a Bridgerton dun, carriage? Dun, dun. Yes, book fans. I strongly suspect that they might have been filming overnight and that they were filming the episode four because, again, they were doing all the pickups for what they needed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Royal Crescent, it does lead up to Penelope's house, but the actual Crescent of Houses mm-hmm. is often used in the show just as streets of yeah, Mayfair. Right. And I wonder if they were filming an overnight scene of after Penelope has left a ball, Colin follows her. So she leaves in a hired hack. Colin follows her in his carriage through the streets of Mayfair through to Bloomsbury and through to the printers but the shot would be of the carriages chasing each Mm. other and also it could be the aftermath of the carriage scene so obviously from the printers or the church or wherever Penelope is followed to by Colin he gets her in his carriage and takes her home and we have the carriage scene of course I wonder if they were also filming the aftermath of the carriage scene just the external shots not the internal character moments but the aftermath of the carriage scene where he pulls up to her house and then Penelope possibly jumps out and runs inside this is my theory am I delusional what do you think no I think that's what happens (laughs) yeah straightforward because I really want the carriage scene to be at night I really want that to be from a ball I was expecting some great debate and you just completely like and in conclusion in conclusion yes I think I just come when I approach these things I approach it from like a logical storytelling point context yeah yeah Mm -hmm. and context Mm -hmm. from within the story itself so that's Mm -hmm. why I feel some of my predictions end up becoming well no I don't even know if they're true but you know we think that they're true is just because like it yeah it works with what we've been given so far and it works within the, the context of the story yeah yeah exactly this will come up at the chapel later because it's a balance of what do we want it to tell us versus what it actually could yeah. tell us. And this will come up later with the wedding that we're going to talk mm-hmm. about. It's how much do we want it to be something versus the contextual clues that leading us right. to the yeah. films. But bath aside, we are finally clean. We're leaving and we're going to go elsewhere beans we're busy 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 because later in january production went over to hampton court palace Mm -hmm. they use a few different spots on the site and we believe that interestingly Catherine drysdale Mm -hmm. our madame delacroix was on set along with many other members of the ton editor's note we believe the mondriches may have filmed here as well as their new carriage which we first spotted in one of the recent stills was photographed at hampton court we do believe they were filming pickups at hampton court however so the mondrich family scenes could technically be from any episode beans have we been to hampton court palace before yeah, and something I will note is 
from this episode, you'll probably Mm -hmm. realize like, oh, wow, they're filming in a lot of places all at once. And they really were because we do think... They're doubling up. Yeah, we do think that they were filming quite a few pickups because the timelines were so interspersed with Queen Charlotte in the summer. But yes, they have been Mm -hmm. to Hampton Court Palace before. And actually, my mother was in London the week after they were filming here. I was so bummed. I was like, you could have gotten pictures. (laughs) You could have been on a you could have been on a trip. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so it's been used numerous times in season one and season two, including the courtyard where carriages mm-hmm. pulled up for presentation and the gardens of Antony and Andwina's wedding in season two, a.k.a. the location of the purpose scene. Oh. Mm-hmm. oh, angel sounds. <laughs> so we're not too sure what they were up to at the palace, but Lecky, we had a couple of crumbs, right? Yes. So it was the, um, the grounds of Hampton Palace and there was a person on a horse and what appears to be a carriage, but the person was painted over and kind of like blurred out of the photo. We know it was an Mm -hmm. actress atop of a horse. We're very curious about who the actress could be. You can see the dress that she's wearing and the horse, but you cannot see the actress. But we also think they filmed some night shoots there as well. Um, And as being said, they could have been filming pickups for other episodes too that we'll see throughout season three. But yeah, they've had a long shooting days at this time in the filming. Also in Hamden Court, I don't know if you guys remember, but they were shooting some sort of market scene within in the court itself. Huh? Somebody got pictures of mm-hmm. it. Yeah. But, you know, as a little balm to the mysteries of production, Nicola was popping up every so often on social media. So on the 27th of January, she posted a Champagne Friday from set, which annoyingly, we've never been able to figure out where it was. But we think with the timings, maybe it was on set at Hampton Court Palace. And also on the 27th of January, Nick posted one of her wig pics featuring a special guest, Luke Newton. Yeah, and her hair is especially crazy here, but she's wearing her Champagne Friday hoodie again, and Luke is donning a black and white tee um, that launched some mime memes. We had a lot of fun with the mime-esque shirt he's wearing. French yeah. Colleen. I was gonna do some mimes to like, sort of like as an example, like a joke, but then I was like, no one can hear the Visual mimes. Visual podcast. That's the point. <laughs> we're, <laughs> listeners, we're all trying to escape the box. We're oh. all trapped in a box. Oh. Lucky, we've been trying to escape the box since May 2022, my love. Oh God, get me out of the box. Then, amongst all this, we got a very interesting crumb from our previous season one lead, Phoebe Dinever, <laughs> who actually confirmed her season three absence. So this took everyone completely by surprise. I questioned myself. In an interview with Screen Rant, she said, sadly, she's not in season three, potentially in the future, but season three, I'm just excited to watch as a viewer. And she later confirmed this with another interview with Variety, where she says, well, I did my two seasons. I've done what I wanted to do with that character. And she had a great arc. But if they ask me back in the future, who knows? Now, this was a huge yeah. surprise because if we think back to May 2022, there was an interview with Jess Brownell that had confirmed that Phoebe Dinover was going to be in mm-hmm. the season. So to hear that she wasn't was a huge shock. And I think the implications for season three were particularly interesting because book fans, you know that Daphne has a very crucial role in Colin's yeah. story, which we're going to cover in our book reread. And we saw in season one that this had been transposed over to the show in a little bit. They had a unique bond, which we explored in mm-hmm. our rewatch. And it left fans wondering who's going to take over this role for yeah. Colin and is Daphne going to be referenced? Has she had another child? As we saw from Queen Charlotte, she has. Yeah. But yeah, do you remember being shocked by this? Super surprised. Yeah. But um, having seen Queen Charlotte and uh, the, the footage of Violet playing with the what looks like a new Bridgerton baby, I think we're, they're going to use mm. the excuse that Daphne just had another child and can't make it to the town for that season or mm-hmm. something like that. So if that relationship of Colin and Daphne isn't going to be able to happen in the same way, like maybe she might like pop up in like she sends her regards or she sends him a letter or something are we expecting anyone else to step into that role I think we've talked a lot about potentially Fran yeah. maybe taking that role for Colin mm-hmm. or maybe Anthony continuing the tradition that Daphne had for Anthony in season two mm-hmm. of being that kind of critical support yeah. or will it be an amalgamation of characters supporting well I think it's because they paired them up differently Daphne was closer to Anthony yeah. Eloise closer mm-hmm. to Benedict mm-hmm. so now Fran will be closer to Colin they're just doing like the three eldest sisters lining up with three eldest brothers it's like the birth order matter up right greg and hyacinth also seem much closer because they're closer in age and yeah. so i think that's fran going to be stepping in do i think he's going to have like crucial conversations with antony and ben yeah i do think so but i think as in terms of like his female familial counterpart it's going to be fran mm-hmm. i like this because colin also plays a role in in fran's book yeah so i wonder if he'll come back in yes. her season and kind of be that support for her as well return the favor And it'll be nice because Fran will be going through that journey rather than having gone through that journey and imparting posthumous wisdom. 
wisdom yeah. it will be like them together which i think we talked about a lot last episode so but yeah we are we're pretty gutted that phoebe won't be in it because i love nothing more than the family mm-hmm. scenes and it's really sad that we're not going to get all of them together yeah. but you know hopefully in the future but then towards the end of january we had a few more crumbs so one of the writers celebrated birthday on set and it looked like they were filming up in uxbridge um we're not 100 sure on the specific location but it looks like it was the interior of a studio perhaps one in the bridgerton house maybe a little conversation between colin and his brothers and on the 3rd of february simone ashley was interviewed with grazia she talked about how proud she was that people were able to find joy in seeing a moment in the, her culture that related to them on screen and she talked a lot about the representation and what kate meant to viewers and then in terms of season three she said what's so special is that every season there's a new focus on a new love story so i'm really excited for everyone to see penelope and colin's love story unfold because it's been a long time coming <laughs> but i'm equally as excited for everyone to see kate settling into the bridgerton family and a little bit more of her backstory as well that last line there backstory yeah. that caught a lot of people's attention that last line mm. we were saying last episode that the tension won't exist in the happily ever after couple mm. but we can still explore elements of their character so for kate that is going to be coming into the fold mm. and that makes a lot of sense because she's stepping into a new role she'll be reflecting as well as looking forward on the future and finding her footing mm-hmm. so that was exciting but some more filming from the 4th to the 8th ish of february i think we were oh well i've no too fucking well we were over <laughs> at chiswick house in london Yeah, and they haven't filmed here before. This is a new location for them to film. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. And I believe that somebody here might have had a very personal experience over in Chiswick. (laughs) Life-changing. Beans, I hate to do this. It's Chiswick. Fucking (laughs) ballsack. Did she say Chiswick? I did. I did. That's okay. It's just a long-running joke at this point, Beans. Yeah, it really is. (laughs) Can I just go... Chiswick, and then you replace every time I say Chiswick. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. Chiswick. <laughs> anyway, somebody here might have had a very personal experience over in Chiswick. <laughs> Life changing. So I will say that I had just moved to London at this time. Veg, we were not yet acquainted properly, but I just moved to London. I'd been away traveling. I was back, and I was on some crumbs hunt trying to make up for lost time. So we we knew that filming was taking place over at Chiswick House. I actually spoke to a random person, a very random interaction, not about the show. And they mentioned that they'd been to Chiswick and just seen some filming. And they're like, oh yeah, everyone was dressed in like really beautiful dresses. And she was like, I think it was for one of those shows, like, oh, I don't know, like Bridgerton or something like that. And I was like, oh no way. (laughs) (laughs) Running. Yeah, my (laughs) beans is my mean running. Meanwhile, I've got you guys on the chat like, are you fucking going to listen to this? Um, I had some time off work, mm-hmm. so I wandered over to see if I could spot any little crumbs taking place. Mm-hmm. And you know what? It was fucking foggy. And I say it was fucking foggy. I don't think you understand how foggy it was. The photos don't do justice to how foggy it was. <laughs> I trundled all the way over to Chiswick and got absolutely fuck all basically is the top and bottom of my crumbs hunt what's hilarious is i you saw can a light see, thingy like, yeah you can see the like si- the silhouette of the light through the fog there's also like <laughs> the exterior when the fog cleared a little bit you have this other one here where you can kind of see the outside of the house with its really beautiful columns in the fog it's very like atmospheric <laughs> but you didn't intend for it to look that way no it was it, it looks like a gothic horror is being filmed yeah. as opposed to a light fluffy romance show yeah so i didn't see anything i failed massively in this task and then you know what i got on the bus went back and 10 minutes later (laughs) the sun appeared in the sky like a beacon of hope it came gorgeously sunny crystal clear and then on fucking social media (laughs) i saw loads of photos of all these passers-by with the beautiful shots from set that i did not see so i can't say it was a successful crumbs hunt but when the sun came out as I say, other people posted lovely photos and you could see, I was so annoyed, you could see the Featherington carriage. Yep. Yeah. You could see all sorts. I did speak to a couple of the staff that were on the grounds and they wouldn't say what was being filmed, but they were like, oh yeah, they just filmed, they've completely blocked this whole section off so you could like still walk in the park mm-hmm. and like people like running and stuff, yeah. which is where a lot of the photos were taken from, but you couldn't get to like a big chunk. So they'd blocked off a big area at the actual house itself. Yeah. So again, she was allowed to be there. I was allowed to be there. I was allowed to be there. I was on a walk, but couldn't fucking see anything. So, Lecky, do we have any idea what was being filmed at Chiswick? So, other fans and passersby strolled past the location, and they spotted several carriages, including the Featherington carriage, as Ovis mentioned, and what looks like the Sterling carriage, and the mysterious Mm -hmm. yellow carriage that we mentioned before. It's always back up there, (laughs) the duck feet. But we were more intrigued by some of the props and the set decor. There were decorative urns with handles that resembled swans. (laughs) Swans back. And they had erected a 
fake wall, but what got us really excited is that the fact that the words exterior church wall were written on the side. Um, so this led us to believe mm -hmm. they were shooting a pollen scene that takes place outside of a church at some point, possibly at this time. Um, it's also possible that they reused this wall from an earlier set or something too, but mm -hmm. we think they may yeah, have been maybe, maybe. doing like the exterior of uh, a church scene, maybe for a wedding, who knows? It looked like they were filming up towards the house and we will share photos of the front of the house mm -hmm. on social media so you can kind of see what we mean. Yeah. And this is going to connect to a later scene that we're going to talk about in depth. You know what's coming, we're off to a chapel. But it could be, and um, contextually when we look back at this, it could be that, as you say, Blecky, they were filming the exterior of something. So the exterior of the church, yeah. maybe the carriages pulling up to the church, mm -hmm. and that the interior of the church scene is going to be filmed uh, elsewhere. Yeah, the chapel. I don't think they were filming inside the house itself. Mm -hmm. I think they were just filming externally and possibly in the grounds. I think some of the leaks looked like they were in the grounds. I will say, I am so interested to see this final scene because it was so unbelievably foggy. And I don't know how they're going to reconcile the footage. I don't know how they can salvage it. I'm looking at this urn photo, sorry. And the bottom also mm -hmm. has this like Grecian pattern to it. It does, it does, it does. I just like the thought of this maybe being the uh, the exterior outside of like the chapel and there's the, the swan decoration <laughs> and with Greek. Because you'll see Chiswick uh, House, it has that kind of Grecian element yes, to it. it does, that yeah. you've seen at places like Ostley. And because when we go to the church later on, it's at Old Royal Naval College and the exterior it's very different. doesn't look like a church, does it, Veg? Yeah. No, it doesn't it's just sort of part of the wider thing i want to say i don't have the foggiest idea of what this scene could possibly be <laughs> oh thanks beans yeah. for that pun <laughs> you're hilarious i was suffering i have not a clue what it could possibly be <laughs> speaking of churches and weddings in our last episode we were cheersing our prawn cocktails at the possibility of a fran and john wedding are you guys ready for another set of nuptials <laughs> because it's time to head on back where else would we go than to Greenwich, to the old Royal Naval College? Well, hello there, Lecky. Hello. Thank you for joining me once again in our little post-excavation report. It's been a while since we've been on a call together. Yeah, it's kind of nervous. <laughs> I feel like I haven't done this in a while. And by a while, I mean like a week. <laughs> But to me now, that feels like a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So normally, Lecky, as you will know from our past Crumbs expeditions that we've got, we've gone on many an expedition together, haven't we, over the years? Mm -hmm. Many a spiral. So this part of our Crumbs episode is usually where we take all the crumbs we've had and we clown out our ideas for each episode. Mm -hmm. Now, as you know, Lecky, first of all, we don't know when to shut the fuck up. So this block has been split into two episodes. Right, yeah. <laughs> Meaning that our episode seven and episode eight predictions are actually going to come in our next episode, right? Right. We'll go through that then. Yes. But the interesting thing about block four is that they did a lot of pickups for episode one, especially in Bath. Yeah. So I thought, Lecky, the last time that we planned out what our idea of episode one was, it was way back. I can't remember when we originally did. November? Ages ago. A different <laughs> lifetime. Mm -hmm. I think at that point, we only had the to dumb stills. We didn't have any other information. Yeah. And it's fair to say, since then, things have changed. Got quite a few more crumbs. We have clips now. We're really living in the future. Mm -hmm. So I thought, like, if you don't mind, in this little post excavation, we can maybe do an updated rundown of episode one. Yep. But hold your horses. Just before we get into that, I think we've got a couple of other things we just need to sweep up. So first of all, Lecky, a theory that has been doing the rounds. Mm -hmm. I read it posted last week about a torn dress theory. Do you want to explain a little bit about what this is? We will share the link in our show notes so you can go look mm -hmm. as well. But basically a very clever, eagle-eyed pollen sleuth noticed in the goodnight Mr. Bridgerton saying that when Penelope stalks away, the back of her dress appears to be torn. It appears like it's been mm -hmm. ripped. Mm -hmm. And so this naturally sent everyone spiraling about what this could mean. And we're going to share our theories of the torn dress in our little breakdown and huge shout out to that redditor congratulations to that redditor for spotting it it's very dark see i think we're all just like <laughs> watching colin just watching her walk away in dismay mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. none of us paid attention to the dress but if you lighten the scene it really does look like it's been torn and i think if this is what's happened i think yeah. it's a really good tie back to the Vauxhall scene mm -hmm. where obviously cressida ruined pen's dress but it also harkens back to the book where cressida did the same as well she she ruined pen's dress one of the only dresses she felt really pretty in yes so it does kind of tie into this tension mm -hmm. and it gives colin his little attempt at a hero moment but this time it just completely yeah. backfires on him it could be like like you say like that 101 Vauxhall heroic moment yeah the reception isn't what he'd hoped the hero complex gets denied mm -hmm. we will revisit this torn dress in a moment when we delve into episode one but a couple of other other things that have come up recently. Lecky, you know how much we've theorized over the soundtrack. 
I mean, we have on hand Vitamin String Quartet's number one fan. <laughs> I'm in like a top percentage. I don't know what it is, but it was an embarrassingly high. <laughs> no one on this earth has listened to that cover of Chandelier more than you, Lefty. The most <laughs> ardent follower. I'm sure you saw Making the Rounds. Shortly after the Valentine's event, people noticed that there was a playlist on Spotify called Bridgerton Official Playlist. Mm -hmm. And it had collected all of the songs from season one and season two. And it had some interesting additions to it. So it had versions of Flowers by Miley Cyrus. We had Golden Hour, Daylight, Harry Styles was making an appearance with As It Was, Unholy by Sam Smith, Demons, Imagine Dragons, Rihanna was there with Lift Me Up, Lady Gaga's Bloody Mary, and of course, a version of Yellow by Coldplay, the pollen anthem of all anthems. So this has been doing the rounds and people have been wondering if this is some sort of leak of the playlist or possibly it was added to in anticipation of the Valentine's Day event because we know a lot of music was being played at that event. Lecky, what do you think we've got here? Do you think this is the season three playlist? I don't. I'm a little skeptical. I think it might be a playlist that was maybe curated by Spotify and and here's mm -hmm. why. First of all, the songs are very current. I expected like mm -hmm. maybe at least another throwback in addition to Yellow. And yeah. one of the songs is also Bloody Mary, which is the song that went viral after being featured in Wednesday, which is another Netflix show. So I think mm. it could be kind of odd if they reused it. And I think Lift Me Up was featured in Black Panther as well. But the fact that Wednesday is a Netflix show is more significant to me. I just, it seems like that wouldn't be a song they'd want to reuse. Mm -hmm. And then also music supervisor Justin Camps in an interview, he once expressed the hope that they would include a Dua Lipa or Olivia Rodrigo song in season three. And while that doesn't technically mean there will be one, it seems like something they might try to include if they had a chance to. And there isn't one there. The mm -hmm. songs are all from the same group as well. It's the Ground Zero Academy Orchestra, I believe, which isn't mm -hmm. a usual Bridgerton artist. So usually they have Duomo, Midnight String Quartet, or Vitamin String Quartet, as we just mm -hmm. discussed. So I think this might just be a playlist that was kind of curated by Spotify, but we could be wrong. It's interesting because when you look at the breakdown of the songs, they are all kind of riffing on season three ideas, which is, mm -hmm. I think, what has piqued so many people's interest. All the light references. I think we've privately talked about Flowers being a really good song for Penn. Mm -hmm. As it was, it's always been on my playlist. Unholy by Sam Smith would make a great carriage scene, I think. Mm -hmm. And it just seems like songs that have gone viral on TikTok recently yeah. as well. Yeah. Maybe it's too trendy. I don't know. I think they had Nirvana song in season mm -hmm. two. Mm -hmm. A couple of throwbacks. In Madonna. And Charlotte, we had some older songs as well. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, when you go and look at this playlist, those songs, all of these songs were added in like September. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was during the strike, if you remember. Yeah. And I think production pretty much halted during the strike on editing. Yeah, we don't even know if they were editing at the time. Why would that have been added to a playlist back in September when we don't even know if it had been finalized at that point? Mm -hmm. My stance on it is, I don't think this is the official playlist. If it was the official playlist, List, I wouldn't be mad. Right. If these are the songs, I'm happy with those. Yellow's on there. I mean, I will... I'll cry forever if Perfect isn't on there, but Yellow's on there and that's really all we could have hoped for. So let us know your thoughts. Do you think this is a playlist? Any surprises? I think it would work if it is, but I'm still not convinced. We will see, I'm sure, in time. And the other thing we want to touch on before we get into a proper post situation report is another Reddit post, which definitely piqued our interest. This was a post by a Brazilian fan who pointed out that in different languages, the episode titles are ever so slightly different. Mm -hmm. So this Redditor shared their Brazilian titles. Now, if we have any listeners elsewhere in the world and you know what your titles are in your language and they have slight differences to the English versions, please let us know because we're so intrigued to know these little differences and to see if there are any little crumbs that we can get from them. Let you see these episode titles. We have had many a conversation about them. Mm -hmm. A couple of them are very similar or exactly mm -hmm. the same or with the romancing Mr. Bridgerton, that's I think the secrets of Mr. Bridgerton, which is the Brazilian title of the book. Title so of the, the book, book yeah. title is being translated in that way. Mm -hmm. But there are a couple of differences. Do you want to take us through them? Yes, so 301 is the Flower Awakened, 302 mm. is Under the Moonlight, 305 is Race Against Time, 307 is Holding Hands, and 308 is Revelations. Which one has got you most interested out of those? Well, I suppose Revelations kind of hints mm. more at the unmasking of Lady Whistledown, not necessarily to the public, but perhaps to the Queen, as we've speculated. Yeah. Yeah. And then also Race Against Time mm. is kind of more interesting than TikTok because to me yeah. it, it suggests that there's slightly more urgency than TikTok uh -huh. does. That there might be some other hardship for Pollen to overcome in that episode or maybe even a scandal breaking out in one of the other subplots perhaps like yeah. Benedict and Lady Tilly or something. TikTok was my favorite episode title of mm -hmm. them all. But Race Against Time is like there's a 
different pressure to that, isn't there? Right. Yeah, there's a ticking clock. <laughs> no pun intended. Exactly. Who is racing against it? So I'm intrigued. Also, under the moonlight, mm-hmm. that moon, I mean, they've been known as moonlight pollen for ages. So it's, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's funny to see them actually have that term. And then 307, very similar to joining of hands, but holding hands is a little bit softer. Very sweet. Hopefully mm-hmm. the wedding episode. Yes. So yeah, let us know if your language has a slightly different phrasing. We're so intrigued by these. But Lecky, get your tools back. We've got to get to work. <laughs> Are you ready to give episode one another updated go? Once again, just to reiterate, this is completely our delusion. We fully expect this to be wrong, but you know, we've got to pass the time, haven't we, Lek? Yeah, a clown's got a clown. And also, apologies for how long this is. (laughs) Just pouring through our little word document here. (laughs) Did take us a while. (laughs) Lekki, would you like to kick us off? Episode one, take it away. Episode one, Out of the Shadows. This season is seasoning everyone who is everyone and maybe one or two future laughing stocks of the town have returned <laughs> for the social season in April 1815. Ladies and gentlemen are promenading and we catch up with a butterfly bedecked green carriage Aww. as it trundles through the streets of Mayfair. Before we can investigate just who is inside the carriage, we instead find ourselves in a moment of calm amidst the usual Bridgerton chaos. Cantonese steal a little moment for themselves as the rest of the family, led by a characteristically excited Violet, prepared to leave for Fran's presentation, only to discover they have no idea where exactly Fran is. Hilarity ensues before the family hears the tinkling of piano keys. Following the noise, the flummoxed Bridgertons find Fran calmly playing piano in the drawing room. When Violet reminds Fran that it's her presentation today, dearest, Fran perhaps nods non-committally and makes a remark about how her keys perhaps need retuned. It's been a while since she's played this particular piano. In fact, it's like she's playing it for the very first time. Would you believe it? <laughs> but meanwhile, Lecky, the Featherington carriage finally reaches its destination across the street and we get a little peek inside to find a slumbering Porsche with a sleeping mask and a determined looking Penelope in some very familiar dresses, with a few new embellishments of course, (laughs) and curiously, sans prudence. Where on earth has she got up to? (laughs) But as the carriage comes to a stop, Penelope tries to awaken her mother. As we've mentioned in other Crumbs episodes, hopefully Portia is a very heavy sleeper, might come in handy later on. (laughs) So it takes Pen a few tries before an annoyed Portia removes her sleeping mask and snaps back at Penelope to ask what in the devil is so important she needs to interrupt her beauty sleep. Pen brattily replies that they've stopped. When Portia asks why they've stopped, Pen cheerily remarks that they've arrived, mirroring a similar conversation that might happen during another little carriage ride in episode four. <laughs> Only on that occasion, I imagine Pen won't be so excited to have reached her destination. They're back home. <laughs> and as the two climb out of their luggage laden carriage, they find the Featherington staff waiting to greet them, including a new maid for Penelope. And what's that? Suspicious urchins are instigating plot points. This is a <laughs> reference to a very hilarious tweet about the paper boys that were seen running around bath while Bridgerton was filming there, which we will share. And by instigating plot points, I mean they've begun to pass out the first issue of Lady Whistledown for the season. Yep, Penelope has timed the release just so that the newest issue lands as she arrives home. And as she beams in satisfaction, we see a gentleman in a suspiciously familiar baby blue coat holding an issue of Lady Whistledown behind her. And as Pen heads inside, Lady Whistledown's voice rings out in voiceover. Lady Veg, get the fuck out of bed. (laughs) <laughs> give us the <laughs> give us the voice over. Thank you very much. Dearest gentle reader, we've been apart far too long. At last, London's smart set has made its return, and so too has this author. But, Lecky, that's not the only person who's returning for the season. As we see a curious sight of the Mondriches piling out of a carriage in front of a new estate in Kent, we perhaps catch a glimpse of a dishevelled and tragically possibly behatted gentleman pirate <laughs> as he races through Mayfair. Lecky, Lecky, Lecky. <laughs> you know how badly I want this. The hat, specifically? This is the intro. No! <laughs> you know what? Since we had the conversation the other day about the hat, I just find that life is so deeply full of loss. And it's not that we've lost pirate college, it's just that in the gaining, we have. Do you know what I mean? Like, he's a gentleman pirate. He's got a rocker hat. He's a gentleman pirate. Mm-hmm. And you know, if anyone's going to be a gentleman pirate, it was him. It's going to be Colin. Yeah. But Lecky, I've got a vision for how I want this to happen, okay? Are you on board mm-hmm. with me here? Yeah. Let's go. So this is his entrance. This is our hero. This is our main character, our leading man. Mm-hmm. His entrance into London, into the story. Mm -hmm. and I want him on horseback. We think he's trying to get home very quickly for Fran's presentation. And perhaps other reasons. Ever the romantic, Lucky. (laughs) But I think we don't get a full shot of him. I don't think we see it's properly Colin yet. Mm -hmm. I think he's charging through. We see who's stomping through the streets. We see a horse flying past as debutantes hurriedly rustle outside their houses. And I just want tiny little glimpses of pirate. Mm -hmm. I want close-ups. I want a gloved hand tightening on the reins, some boots by the horse. I want that hat. Lucky, he does 
have that hat when he gets to Ranger's house, does he? <laughs> No. So I want that hat to be flying off his head, mm-hmm. which would actually be a cute little... It would be cute. ...tip of the hat, if you will, to the uh, the Penelope meet cute. No pun intended. <laughs> All the puns are intended <laughs> around here. I want the hat to fly off his head, and then we see a gloved hand impatiently pulling at his cravat mm-hmm. to get undone. He is on a mission to get there. But like I say, we don't see him, we just see these tiny little glimpses of our pirate and you know what he might be a gentleman but he's got swagger so if his hat falls onto the ground so be it lucky our days of an uptight colin are long gone so interspersed with these shots of somebody storming through the streets of mayfair we're back at the bridgertons they're all piling out and then suddenly a horse careens to a stop outside the bridgerton abode just as the rest of them are piling outside to leave for Fran's debut mm-hmm. the family all suddenly pause their chaos to glance at the new rival and who jumps down but the one the only the man the myth the set leak legend who saw us <laughs> through the winter it's pirate colin everyone is delighted to see him no one more than us and <laughs> Of course, everyone's happy that he's made it there for Fran's special day. He's quickly embraced by the entire family, including a very sweet ABC hug. Mm-hmm. But Anthony can't quite resist snarking at Colin for his pirate getup, chastising him for his scruffy appearance. Don't worry, Colin, we think you're cool. <laughs> Even without the hat. And as Lady Wilson Jones' voiceover continues with the gossip writer remarking that... As the season begins, the question on everyone's minds is, of course, which newly minted debutante will shine the brightest? The crop this year appears to be rather dazzling. Dazzling indeed. We suddenly see a flurry of feathered debutantes exiting their homes and piling into their own carriages. Time's mm-hmm. a ticking and the Bridgertons really must get going. But not before we see Colin turning to look across the street toward the Featherington home where Penn, who is covertly watching from her window, lets the curtain slip from her fingertips and steps back into the shadows as Lady Whistledown adds that Unfortunately, not every young lady can attract the light. Lucky, that's heartbreaking. <laughs> But the stage is finally set. We have both our leads back in London, back in Grosvenor Square where we need them to be. So it's time to queue up the Bridgerton titles and get this season on the road at long, long last. It's at this point that I personally will sadly cease to exist, having collapsed at the sight of Colin's name appearing on the Bridgerton tree. (laughs) But for those of you who managed to make it through the opening credits, where are we going to find ourselves, Lecky? We find ourselves thrown straight back into the action. There's a lot to establish in episode one as we catch up with all the characters, meet a few new faces, and plant the seeds, sadly, sans plant daddy for the upcoming subplots. The Bridgertons make it to the palace. Francesca is presented in front of the queen. Her presentation goes well, but we can't help but notice that Queen Charlotte is looking a little bored by the endless parade of debutantes. Hmm, interesting. But in terms of our main story, that's why we're here after all, we've previously speculated that perhaps Penn would try to approach Eloise or maybe bump into her accidentally in Grosvenor Square. This is just based on a few set leaks and fan anecdotes we've covered in past Crumbs episodes. But if there is a scene like this, it could be a last ditch attempt on Penn's part to reconcile with her old best friend now that they're both in town again or to at least maybe gauge if Eloise's hunger if hunger she's hungry <laughs> or to maybe at least gauge if Eloise's anger has cooled down during the off season Colin's home so there's no more food in the house everyone's starving at the uh, <laughs> the Bridgeton she's sending food parcels of, of potatoes over yeah we don't think that Elle is going to say anything to Penelope at this point I think we're going to let the tension build here but instead maybe Eloise has returned from the presentation and either pretends not to see Penelope or just outright ignores ignores her and marches straight into the Bridgerton house. Yeah. As if things aren't bad enough for Penn, a certain pirate suddenly appears and tries to speak to her, possibly to express his deep concern for the terrible postal delays that Royal Mail must have been encountering during the <laughs> off-season because there's no other possible explanation why she wouldn't be replying to him. <laughs> but as Colin approaches, Penelope quickly flees the scene. Colin watches after her in a bit of confusion, but he dismisses it. Surely there are reasons, there are simple explanation as to why she didn't stop to speak to him. Her Colin, if only you knew, and soon you shall. <laughs> At some point after the Featheringtons' arrival, Portia makes a remark about Penelope's prospects, maybe while touching on Prudence's surprising nuptials to one Harry Dankworth in the off-season. Maybe the happy couple calls on the family for tea, allowing us to meet our beloved Dankworth for the first time. And perhaps like in the book, Portia remarks that she is glad for Penelope's spinsterhood, saying Penelope can care for her in her old age. Horrified at the prospect and now fearing Eloise will never forgive her, Pen determinedly marches to her room and hauls open her wardrobe. She studies the contents, seeing a familiar yellow season one dress and makes the choice to update her wardrobe and try to break free from the life she is currently stuck in. And how is she going to update this wardrobe? Well, there's only one Medice in town that can handle. (laughs) Now there is. (laughs) Well, yeah. Whose fault is that? Penn has made sure that there's only one woman in town who's up to the (laughs) desk. And of course, Penelope heads to her old friends, the Medice, to ask Jen to make her a new wardrobe. You've got to get that order in early, you know. You can't just (laughs) be conjuring these dresses apart thin air. Unfortunately for Penn, though, she's never been one that's to be blessed with good timing when it comes to the Bridgerton siblings. 
So she walks into the Mendes and it turns out that she's not the only one being turned into a pincushion that day. Yet, just as Pen arrives, she has a very awkward run-in with a rather frosty Eloise. Pen wants to make amends, but forced into speaking with her ex-best friend, Eloise makes it very clear that she still has a very low opinion of Penelope and she warns her to stay away from her family, but perhaps also hints that she doesn't plan to expose Penelope, she just wants nothing to do with her. Mm -hmm. A quietly heartbroken and rejected Pen tries to push on at Jen's. She still has a plan to go ahead with and is even more resolved now that she knows that her friendship with Eloise is, I mean, pretty much dead in the dust. Mm -hmm. And it's at this point in conversation with the two women that we fully hear Pen's intentions for the season. She wants to find a husband and get away from her family while still continuing her work as Lady Whistledown. Later that afternoon, perhaps, Penelope attends a garden party at the Livingston house with the extended Featherington family. After sampling the cheeses and smelling the biscuits on display, (laughs) Albion and Philippa take turns fondling her parasol and we (laughs) we see a shot of Penelope moodily surrounded by the other couples. Perhaps we have another pollen cold shoulder moment here, which leaves Colin puzzled, but still not fully putting the pieces together. Maybe the Ton are also busy fawning over Colin and his new swagger, causing Colin to not fully be able to pull pen for a good catch up. Of course, we have our subplots to catch up with. Maybe we have some glimpses of Ben taking up his responsibility because Mm -hmm. our dear Viscount is severely indisposed, caught up in a very sweet moment between him and his beloved wife. They're in Kate's study and they're much more dressed down than we last saw them. Cantony are perhaps lost in conversation discussing the future season and maybe their own plans for the season. Maybe baby perhaps. Mm -hmm. Just saying. At last, the Danbury Ball rolls around, the Bridgertons arrive and so do the Featheringtons, and we see Penn has decided to wear one of her new dresses to the occasion, which results in a few insulting and bewildered comments from Portia and her sisters at the ball. Portia maybe remarks that gentlemen like happy colors, so Penelope can't seriously expect anyone to dance with her, while Prudence Aww. rudely complains that Penelope is clashing with the rest of them. Soldiering on, however, Penelope tries and feels spectacularly to attract attention from gentlemen, which Lady Danbury observes from afar. Maybe Elle and Cressida notice this, or maybe Cressida makes a sarcastic remark in greeting to Elle about Penelope or the ball in general, only to be surprised when she receives a cordial response from Elle, who maybe echoes her opinion, the beginning of a tenuous friendship. As other subplot shenanigans get underway, maybe Fran meets John, or Michael, or both, and Violet's temporarily distracted from her chaperoning duties by a certain someone from Lady Danbury's past. Cressida carries on her two-season-long tragically doomed crush, attempting to snag Colin's attention, only to see him eyeing Penelope across the ball. Colin and his swagger is turning out to be something of a talking point at the ball, with many remarking about the charming third-born son who's newly back from his travels. But charming though he may be, Colin is determined to get Penn's attention after being brushed off by her all day. He's finally had enough, but as he approaches, Cressida gets there first, and in a foul mood, Cressida confronts Penn and makes a nasty remark about Penn's dress, maybe seeing how it doesn't seem to have made any difference. Penn snucks back, maybe not super forcefully, we think she's saving that for later, but perhaps enough that a nearby Lady Danbury takes note of Penelope's wit, and the comment is enough to tick Cressida off so that when Penn turns away and tries to leave the conversation, Cressida steps on her hem and rips the back of Penn's dress. I will hate this. (laughs) But alas, you know, we've got to start from somewhere. Mm -hmm. Titters ring out across the ballroom. Colin sees the whole thing, which only adds to Penelope's mortification, and she quickly exits the ballroom in embarrassment. And you know, never want to take a cue, Colin determinedly follows her outside. He's like, great, this is a perfect <laughs> opportunity to catch up with her. <laughs> How's that going to go for him? In a misjudged attempt at cheering her up, and rather desperate to know why she hasn't answered his letters, Colin makes a remark that the colour of Penn's dress rather suits her. Penn, already at a breaking point due to a truly disastrous day, finally snaps. The goodnight Mr. Bridgerton scene happens. Colin's jaw hits the floor harder than Book Penn's face did after being dragged out of the carriage, and our boy is left silenced as Penelope storms away from the dance. Ball. Penn probably wants nothing more than to crawl into bed and forget about her terrible night, but instead she has to race over to Bloomsbury while chronicling her failure in excruciating detail, ready for the ton to read in the next morning's issue of Lady Whistledown. No rest for the wicked, eh, Penn? Late that episode, I'm sure many scenes have happened in between this, but we're skipping ahead, okay? <laughs> the ton is going to gather for yet another ball. Colin observes Penn as she attempts to attract the attention of a suitor, but now he has a little bit more perspective. He's also feeling a little taken aback at the damage he's done to their friendship, and he is now determined to make amends with her. As he watches her, he understands that this is something she wants. Strangely enough, it creates a weird pit in the bottom of his stomach that he can't quite explain. So (laughs) maybe he has a snack to put that horrible sickly feeling aside. We'll dig into that later, eh, Colin? (laughs) But as he watches Penn struggle with suitors, he also reflects that her difficulties on the marriage market may be something he has had a hand in due to his actions Mm -hmm. at the end of the last season. 
Perhaps after another mortifying moment at the ball, Penn slinks back into the shadows and is approached by Lady Danbury for a wallflower to form a wallflower pep talk. Mm. Penn maybe makes a self-deprecating joke about herself and Lady Danbury alludes to her being something more. Maybe not those words exactly, but something in the vein, just like in the book, of Penelope having more value than she realises and hints that someone will notice sooner rather than later. Perhaps we have a little cut to a dejected puppy dog, Colin, but one who looks increasingly determined before returning to Penn, who looks taken aback by the conversation. But before Penelope can respond, Lady Danbury quips that, ah, your Mr. Bridgerton is approaching, and we see Colin making a beeline for her, sorry Edmund, rest in peace, <laughs> uh, Colin asks Penn to dance, partly because Lady Danbury is watching, and also partly because Lady Danbury just told her to get her shit together, <laughs> Penn can't refuse, and allows Colin to pull her back out of the shadows and onto the dance floor, where they have a healing dance. Mm. Lecky, I know this dance has been very close to your heart. Do you want to tell mm-hmm. us a little bit more about it? So we believe Colin will deliver a heartfelt apology and offer to help Penelope find a husband this season, speaking with the utmost mm. sincerity. Penn tentatively agrees and they will smile at each other. But as the dance continues, though, Colin finds himself lost in Penn's eyes and maybe <gasps> his smile briefly falters as we realize just how screwed he really is. Lecky. How are you feeling? I mean, that dance at the end, I think I cried when you sent me that at first. Mm -hmm. That is perfect. So I like this vision that it ends on this moment where they have a very genuine moment where they heal their friendship and we get over that hurdle. Mm -hmm. We were also talking about this this morning, um, nothing to do with the this morning, like just today. (laughs) We were were discussing this today for clarity, sorry. But this could also be another parallel to Vauxhall because at the end of episode one, in season one, we have that dance between Simon and Daphne and we see Penelope Mm -hmm. kind of watching from the outskirts of the ball. But this time she'll be the one dancing and perhaps other people will be observing her. But she will finally have her moment where she sheds kind of like that wallflower persona and is dancing. Are you saying, Lecky, that they will end the episode out of the shadows? Yes, (laughs) in the spotlight. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Well, Thank you for conning with me. I'm sure now that we've said that, none of it will be true. (laughs) Yeah, that's all wrong. So well done to us. But thanks for listening. (laughs) But yeah, thank you for listening. So that's our updated ideas on episode one. Let us know if you think we've missed anything. Let us know if you think there's going to be any other scenes. I I really can't wait for episode one. I know that's a silly thing to say, but I really want that opening sequence so badly. Yeah, that'll be great to finally see. One day in the coming weeks, in the coming days, who knows? Mm -hmm. And as is tradition in our Crumbs episodes, did we see any Collins? Did we see any pens during the filming leaks? Well, there's only one person who knows the answer to that. Queen Beans, take it away. Members of the ton, we have Blurs. Okay, Lecky, thank you for joining me in this episode. As you know, we had to split this episode in two because we Mm. just kept talking and kept talking and kept talking and it was really long. And had we had all of Block 4 as one episode, I actually don't know how long it would have ended up. (laughs) So in the spirit of all things season three, we're doing another (laughs) two-parter. Fortunately, hopefully you won't have to wait a month for this next one. So unless there is an emergency crumb in the meantime, our next episode will be finishing up the rest of block four. And finally, we actually mean it this time. We say this all the time, but we are actually will be finishing up our whole crumbs expedition yes so by the end of next episode you'll have from start to finish all of the filming leaks all of our theories and we will share with you our theories for episode seven and episode eight Mm -hmm. maybe little weddings on the cards Mm -hmm. you ready to go back to church (laughs) yeah take me to church and hopefully include the song on the playlist thank you very much please But in the meantime, Lecky, where can everyone find us? You can find us at Pod on Instagram and TikTok and on YouTube. And Beans, wherever you may be, my love, do us the honour. Sing us out. Does violin do 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 do